used his amulet also, the lone hunter he'd borrowed from Han. Han wondered if the amulet Elena had made for him was permanent or temporary. That would be worrisome, the knowledge that his amulet would eventually lose power. He was beginning to understand why wizards were unhappy with the clan's power over them. Han looked over at Micah, whispering with his cousins. It made him twitchy. Han wasn't used to sharing territory with an enemy. You drove him out or he drove you out. You hushed him or he hushed you. And life went on. For one of you. The side door opened, and a wizard in a wheeled chair rolled into the room. Though the sleeves of his robe were decorated with master's bars, he looked to be only three or four years older than the newling students. He had cinnamon hair, pale skin, and a bitter expression, as if he expected to be disappointed. When he reached the base of the podium, he swung forward two arm canes and levered himself out of the chair. The foam of voices gradually settled into an awkward silence as the master struggled up the steps to the lectern and spread a sheaf of papers and a battered-looking book atop it. His amulet glittered in the sunlight cascading through the windows, a large quartz crystal shaped into a castle keep. He didn't call the roll, but his gaze whispered over the assembled students, resting on Han and Dancer for a long moment. You are, ah, uh, Dancer and Alistair, I presume, he said, looking down and sorting through his papers. I am Master Griffin. I have the perilous and unfulfilling task of teaching spellcasting to newlings. How fortunate we are that this year's newling class is so exceptionally diverse. I feel quite in context. Han stared at the master, unsure whether they'd just been insulted or if he was poking fun at himself. Griffin raised his eyes from his papers. They were a startling blue-green color, and when Han met his gaze, cold trickled down his spine. Despite the master's unhealthy pallor, it was a handsome face, a poor match for the graceless body. Proficient Hadron tells me that the two of you traveled through Arden to come here. Arden is a dangerous place for anyone these days, but especially for charmcasters. Which raises the question, are you too stupid, unschooled, or merely foolhardy? Well, that was an insult for sure. Han couldn't help looking at Micah, who gazed up at the ceiling, a faint smile curving his mouth. Han kept his street face on. I've had better ideas, he said, shrugging. Surprise flickered across the master's face as some of the other students snickered. Then Griffin's gaze dropped to Han's amulet, and his eyes widened. He looked up into Han's face, studying him with fierce intensity. Interesting that you would choose such a dangerous road, Alistair, he said finally. It seems that you are not afraid of the dark. Han suspected he wasn't talking about the road through Arden at all. Well, Han said, meeting that blue-green gaze, sometimes there's no choice. There is always a choice, Griffin said. Flipping open a thick book, he said, Speaking of journeys, I asked you to read from Kinley, the twelfth chapter, where he discusses the challenges of traveling in Edeon. Kinley instructs us that... The door to the classroom opened, and two more students filed in. Han stared, along with everyone else. It was Fiona Bayar and lovelorn Will, who'd chased him and Dancer across the border into Delphi. They looked travel-battered and cranky, so Han assumed they'd come directly to class after ditching their baggage at their dormitories. Will's face was bronzed by the sun, but Fiona was pale as ever, as if the sun wouldn't presume to penetrate her icy skin. She'd taken her hair out of the braid, and it billowed in long waves past her shoulders. She wore traveling clothes, a rough-spun sweater, corded jacket, and canvas breeches that showed off her long legs. No student robes. Fiona ran her chilly gaze over the room. When her eyes settled on Master Griffin, they widened in surprise. 
Adam, she cried, as if the entire class weren't looking on. Turning to Will, she said, Look, Will, it's Adam Griffin of all people. Blood of the demon, Han thought. My spellcasting teacher is pals with the Bayars. It's no wonder my feet are in the flame. Striding forward, Fiona extended her hand toward Master Griffin as if she expected him to kiss it. Father told me you'd entered orders, but I had no idea. Master Griffin had turned a deep raspberry red color, an amazing transformation. He made no move to take her hand, but seized the podium in a white-knuckled grip. It's Master Griffin, Newling Bea, he said, and though I'm on faculty at Mistwork House, do note that I've not taken vows, nor do I intend to. Fiona pulled back her hand, realizing that there was no kiss in the offing. Really? I must have heard wrong. It did seem like a good option for someone in your... situation. A good outcome for a cripple, you mean, Master Griffin said softly. Perhaps so. How fortunate that you and Newling Mathis made it here safely. Next time, please wear appropriate attire to class. Now, take your seats so that we can proceed with our lesson. This constant influx of students has put us behind. That acid tongue is sweeter now, Han thought. Fiona flung her hair back over her shoulders and turned toward the risers to look for a seat. Her gaze fell on Han and Dancer in the second row. She froze, going even paler than before. Alistair? she whispered. I don't believe it. Will took her elbow. Come on, Fiona, he said. Fiona didn't move. What are you doing here? Leaning forward, she extended trembling hands toward Han as if she were itching to close them around his throat. Han rested his hands on the table in front of him, forcing himself not to make any defensive moves. Your brother can fill you in, he said, jerking his head toward Micah. Now, do you mind? If you come to class late, the least you can do is sit and shut it. I came here to learn something. He tapped the cover of his book and raised his eyebrows. Fiona continued to stare at Han as if she couldn't believe her eyes. Will tugged at her arm. Let's sit, he said quietly. Fiona finally allowed Will to tow her to a seat in the back row. She had barely settled into her seat when Griffin barked, Alistair, what does Kinley tell us about the risks and benefits of traveling in Edeon? Welcome back, the acid-tongued master. Han swallowed hard, sweat popping out all over. I don't know, he said. No? Griffin sighed. That is disappointing. Then define Edeon for us. I'm sorry. I, uh, I've not done the reading, Han admitted. Instead, he'd been busy laying charms of protection around his room. Somebody snickered. Out of the corner of his eye, Han could see Micah's smirk of amusement. He could feel Fiona's eyes boring into him like hot pokers. No? The master ticked. Here to learn, but not apparently ready to learn. Do you expect me to do all the work? No, Han shook his head. Do you expect me to shovel knowledge into the gaping maw of your untried mind? No. No what? No, sir. Han said. Griffin leaned forward, speaking softly, but still loudly enough that everyone else could hear. Are you certain you really belong here, Alistair? Yes, sir, Han said, meeting the master's eyes defiantly. Griffin paused, then, still glaring at Han, said, Darnley, risks and benefits? Edeon is the world of dreams said a solemn, brown-haired boy whose wizard stoles were finely embroidered with boar's heads. With proper training, support from a powerful amulet, and a close connection with another person, it is theoretically possible to communicate across distances. 
that's the benefit. Theoretically, you say. Don't you believe it? Griffin cocked his head. It is uncommon enough that some scholars say it is only a myth. Others say that this was common before the breaking, but rarely heard of since. What are the risks that Kinley describes? Griffin prompted him. Well, Edeon can be enticing, Darnley said, because a skilled charm caster can shape it to his hopes and desires. It's possible to get lost in it and never return to the real world. Also, you can become trapped if your amulet runs out of stored power. And finally, Kinley says that if you're killed in the world of dreams, you die in real life. What could kill you in a dream, Stefan? A pale-haired Northern Islander asked, rolling her eyes. I've had a lot of nightmares, but I always wake up alive. Magic, Darnley said, tapping his forefinger on the page. Only magic can kill you in Edeon. What evidence does Kinley present? Griffin asked. Why should we believe that he's telling the truth? Silverhair? We shouldn't, the Northern Islander scoffed. Kinley repeats legends from centuries past without question. His books are full of mythological monsters, like water gators and dragons, that no one's ever seen. Couldn't they have once existed, Griffin said. Perhaps they were destroyed in the breaking. If so, is it possible that remnants of the high magic that was common before the breaking persist in the hidden corners of the world? There are no hidden corners these days. Silverhair said. No secrets anymore. Kinley used primary sources, Darnley said. His sketches are based on eyewitness reports. He even conducted his own experiments to verify what he heard. Experiments that no one has been able to duplicate in modern times, Silverhair countered. Perhaps the problem is the tools we use now, Darnley said, touching his amulet. These are much more limited in scope than the amulets of old magic. The Copperheads refuse to provide us with the tools that we need. We'd have to buy old flash on the down-low market, or use heirloom pieces. The debate heated up, swirling around Han, leaving him feeling ignorant and unread. His classmates would have heard these arguments since childhood. They shared a common anger and frustration that they'd missed the golden age of wizardry. Han pressed the heels of his hands against his forehead, feeling out of his depth. He'd heard nothing of Kinley on the streets of Ragmarket. Griffin argued both sides of the question, refueling the discussion when it lagged. He didn't pick on Han again. Maybe he figured his point had been made. The master also left the Bayars in peace. It seemed they'd be given plenty of time to study up. Griffin didn't call on Dancer either, ignoring his raised hand. Han fought down his anger. It was just a different kind of battle, one he'd have to learn to win. Since when had life ever been fair? Though Griffin clearly knew his stuff, Han couldn't help comparing him to Speaker Jemson. Jemson's love of history cascaded over you until you were neck deep and drunk with it. But he made sure all of his students stayed afloat. You can't control what Griffin does, Han thought. What can you control? You can come to class prepared, he thought, no matter what. Griffin allowed the debate to go on for a while longer, then raised both hands, palms out, to bring it to a halt. All right, then. Let's try an experiment of our own, he said. Please turn to page 393. The passage was entitled Portal to Edeon and consisted of lines of spell work, like free verses trickling down the page. Now, choose a partner, preferably someone you already know, Griffin said. If you need a partner, raise your hand. Han turned to Dancer, who shrugged his assent. Arcada paired off with Miphis and Fiona with Will. Micah was left without a partner, since there was an odd number of students in the class. Newling Hayden, Griffin said, all of a sudden noticing Dancer. Perhaps you should pair off with someone more experienced, like Bayar. 
He nodded toward Micah. I can work with Alistair. Dancer shook his head. No, thank you, sir. I know Alistair. I'll stay with him. If you insist, Griffin said with a sour expression. You're with me, Bea. Micah shrugged his indifference, but Han thought he looked relieved. Is Griffin just picking on me again? Han wondered. Did he want to be matched with me for some reason? Or did he want to match Dancer with Micah? Or did it mean nothing at all? This should be easier than communicating across a distance. Face each other and take hold of your amulets, Griffin directed. At the risk of being disappointed, I will assume that you have all stoked them with power in preparation for class. Han had done that, at least, storing magic during the long journey to Odin's Ford. Now choose a location, a place you both know, Griffin said, and don't all go to the Crown and Castle. I want to hear about different places. Dancer leaned toward Han. The fishing hole on Old Woman Creek, he suggested. That was a place on the lower slopes of Hanalea they both knew well, where Han's former employer, Lucius Frowsley, spent most of his time. A place that, as wizards, they were now forbidden to go. Read over the entire spell, Griffin said. Memorize it, since there's no guarantee that Kinley will be available to you in Edeon. The first three lines open the portal. The last three allow you to close the portal and return to reality. The master gave them a few minutes to do that, waiting until they all looked up from their texts. All ready now? Heads nodded around the room. Some of the students looked pale and worried. Some leaned forward eagerly. Others rolled their eyes, like this exercise was a stupid waste of time. Read the first three lines to open the portal, Griffin said. Quietly now, so as not to distract your colleagues. Should you both be successful, you will meet your partner in the dream world. Notice your surroundings, because what you see is a reflection of you. Notice also that you can shape your appearance as you wish. Exchange messages with your partner and immediately return to the classroom. I repeat, don't remain in Edeon longer than a few minutes. Once everyone has completed the exercise, you will report on your experiences. He paused. I know that some of you are skeptical of Kinley's work, but I expect you all to expend some effort here. Taking hold of his amulet, Han read through the opening lines of the spell, while all around him he heard others whispering the words in a splash of accents. For a moment, he was engulfed in a swirling black nothingness. Then, sunlight broke into his thoughts, streaming down through glittering yellow aspens, sparkling on the waters of Old Woman Creek. Leaves swirled and danced on the current. Han shivered. It was cold, colder than Odin's Ford. And moments later, he found himself wearing a fringed and beaded buckskin jacket of clan design, fleece moccasins on his feet. Amazed, he fingered the soft leather. Was it real? It seemed very real. The wind swirling over Hanalea smelled of snow. It lifted the hair from his forehead and set aspen leaves chattering over his head. He looked up the creek. Dancer walked toward him, dressed in leggings and the loose, soft, doe-skin tunic he favored, carrying a fishing pole and a fish basket. What do you think? Han said. Is this it? Dancer shrugged. Let's see if we both remember it the same when we leave. They stood for an awkward moment. Griffin said to exchange messages, Han said. I'll say something to you, and then I'll see if you remember it later. You do the same. He thought a moment. Cat Tyburn is sweet on you, he said, keeping a straight face. Dancer cocked his head. Really? Why do you say that? Han wasn't sure just why he'd said it, except that he knew Dancer wouldn't forget it. She's shy, he said. She has trouble speaking her mind. Right. Fiona Bayar fancies you, Dancer retorted. She can't take her eyes off you. They both burst out laughing. Han's spirits rose. 
It felt good to be back in the fells on familiar ground, even if only in the dream world. We'd better go back, Dancer said. Han took hold of his amulet, ready to speak the closing charm, when the air before him rippled like the surface of a pond as the wind catches it. It coalesced and hardened, displacing light, until the image of a person stood before him. It was a young man, a half-dozen years older than Han, expensively dressed in blue-blood style. His hair was soot-black, his eyes a brilliant blue. Sunlight glittered on the many rings on his fingers. The stranger blinked, looking about, and a triumphant smile spread across his face, as if he'd done something extra special. Han glanced aside at Dancer, but as he did so, his friend shimmered and dissolved, blinking out like a cinder in the dark. Dancer, Han said, taking a step toward the spot where he'd disappeared. You there. Wait. Don't go yet, the stranger said in Fell's speech. Who are you? Han said, backing away, thinking that nobody should be showing up here that he didn't invite. How did you get here? Was it someone from his class intruding? Han didn't recognize him, but that didn't mean anything. Griffin had said that you could change your appearance, so it could be anyone in disguise, even one of the Bayars. Micah and Fiona likely had the most powerful amulets in the class next to his own. Could Micah find his way to a place he'd never been? Then again, the first time they'd met was on Hanalea. You can call me Crow, the stranger volunteered. He brushed a hand through his hair as if preening his feathers. And you are? Tell me how you got here or get out, Han said, a knife magically appearing in his fist. Amulet or not, he'd still go to knives if he got in a jam. He balanced lightly on his feet, ready to jump one way or the other, recalling Darnley's words moments before in the lecture hall. Kinley says that if you're killed in the world of dreams, you die in real life. Please, Crow said, hear me out. I promise it will be worth your time. He took a step forward. Han took a step back. I'm warning you, I'm rum with a blade. It's wise to be wary in your situation. Crow kept shifting, from formal dress to plainer garb to a dean's robe. Either he couldn't decide what suited him, or he liked to dress up. I at least gave you a name, he went on. That's more than you have done. Do you belong to Airy House? There was something in the way he said it, something that set off alarms in Han's head. Han hesitated. Airy House? The Bayar family. Are you one of them? Everything taken together, I would guess not. He studied Han's face. Ah, he said, smiling. I see you are not. In fact, they are not your friends. Han struggled to reclaim his street face. Then tell me, how did you gain possession of that amulet? Crow said, his eyes fixed on Han's jinx piece. You going to tell me why you're here? Han demanded. And stay still, will you? Crow finally settled in his blue blood garb. His jacket looked made to measure, with glitter threads sewn over and trailing sleeves. Han guessed he was handsome, if you liked the type. Crow extended his empty hand toward Han, palm out, as if feeling his heat. You are quite powerful, you know. He tilted his head, appraising Han. And you are well favored, even rather handsome despite your speech. Who was he to judge Han's looks and speech, and why should Han care? I an fancy if that's what you're thinking, Han said. No offense. Crow laughed. I hope not, he said, as if it were a very funny joke. Did you steal your amulet from them? Crow said, looking back at the amulet. If so, I must say I am impressed. What do you mean to do with it? Do they know you have it? Do you have a plan? Han said nothing to this torrent of questions. Crow shook his head. No plan? That's not good. The Bayars, no doubt, have a plan. 
Better think ahead, or you're not going to keep that amulet for long. I won't answer any questions until I know who you really are, Han said. I understand. Crow chewed on his lower lip, thinking. Very well. I can tell you this much. I'm on faculty here at the Academy. I've been looking for a student to mentor, someone capable of mastering higher-level magic. I also need someone who's not afraid to bend the rules a bit. The fact that you are here, and your possession of that amulet, tells me that you might be the person I've been looking for. He raised his hand when Han opened his mouth to speak. I'm not going to tell you any more than that until I know I can trust you. It's still possible that you're in league with my enemies. How do you know the Bayars? Han asked, fingering his amulet, still unsure whether to stay or go. Let's just say we are political rivals, Crow said. I need gifted allies. In return, I'll help you protect yourself against them. Help me how? Han asked. Crow took another step toward Han, looking intently into his eyes. I can teach you how to use that amulet. I can teach you marvelous things. Crow's eyes glittered, his voice low and coaxing, almost pleading. Keep your flash gammon to yourself, Han said. If you want to talk to me, come see me in real life. I'm going back, he added, summoning up the returning words. We have to meet in Edeon, Crow said. It's not safe for us to be seen together. Han stared at him. What do you mean? You have no idea how vulnerable we are. Crow drew a quick breath as though he meant to say something else, then looked aside, distracted. We're out of time, he said. Don't tell a soul about our meeting. No one, do you understand? If the Bayars hear about this, they will kill you and seize your amulet to prevent our meeting again. He paused to let the words sink in, then added, I will meet you a week from tonight, midnight, in Edeon. Mistwork Bell Tower is a private place. Do you know where that is? Han blinked at him, a thousand questions elbowing their way forward. I know where that is, he said, but what makes you think I... We can't be seen together, Crow repeated. Edeon is the only safe place. Rebuild your amulet in the meantime. If you can't come a week from tonight, come the next week, or the next. I'll wait for you each week until you come. Open the portal at midnight and come alone. He shimmered and blinked out. Han was suddenly conscious of a terrible pain in his head. He groaned and opened his eyes, looking into Griffin's grim face. He thought for a moment he might be sick, but that passed. He looked down at his amulet and saw Griffin's hand wrapped around it, just below his. The master was gripping it so hard his knuckles were white and his face shone with sweat. Let go, Han said feebly, tugging at Griffin's fingers with his other hand. You first, he said. I don't want you slipping away again. Reluctantly, Han loosed his hold and wiped his sweaty hand on his breeches. He lay on the stone floor in the lecture hall, his head pillowed on somebody's coat. Beyond Griffin, he saw a circle of faces, the other students in the class. Micah Bayar scowled as if sorry that Han had rejoined the living. He didn't see Fiona. Griffin touched Han's forehead with hot fingers, then finally let go of the amulet. You're out of danger, he said. The maker protects the impaired, it seems. The master sat on the floor, his canes next to him, his robes hiked up to his knees. Griffin's lower legs were scarred and shriveled, the flesh leathery and dark, as though they'd been burnt. Iron braces extended from his ankles past his knees. Griffin followed Han's gaze. Scowling, he yanked the fabric down to cover himself. What happened? Han said, sorry to be caught staring. In Edeon, I mean, he rushed to add. We've established beyond any doubt that you are a fool, Alistair, Griffin said. 
You've managed to drain both your amulet and yourself completely. That's why you needed my help to get back. I hope the journey was worth it. The doors to the classroom slammed open, and a tall, angular woman marched in, followed by Fiona. The stranger's hair was straight and chin-length, a steel-gray streaked with wizard red. Her robes were edged with heavy embroidery, and the multiple velvet bands on her sleeves said she was a high up. What's going on, Master Griffin? she demanded. Newling Bayar tells me there's a student in trouble. Dean Abelard! Griffin gripped his canes and struggled to rise to his feet, seeming embarrassed to be caught on the floor. Can I help? Dancer asked, squatting next to him. When Griffin nodded, Dancer slid his hands under the master's arms and lifted him up. Griffin shook him off as soon as he was upright. Dancer handed him his double canes. There's no trouble, Griffin said. Newling Alistair delayed too long returning from Edeon. From Edeon? Dean Abelard stared down at Han, biting her lower lip. Really? Griffin nodded. He's recovering now. Scrunching her robes in her hands, Dean Abelard knelt next to Han. She pressed the back of her hand against his cheek. Her hand felt blazing hot against his cold skin. Get the boy some water, Abelard commanded, and somebody rushed away to fetch it. Moments later, a cup appeared, and Han drank it dry. Someone knelt next to them, knees pressing into Han's hip. He turned his head. It was Fiona, lips parted, her pale eyes fixed on his face. What's the matter with him? She said, leaning forward, her hair brushing Han's cheek. Will he survive? If he's lived this long, then yes, I expect he will, Abelard said. It was good you came to fetch me. She reached for Han's amulet, then jerked her hand back as if startled when she saw the design. An interesting choice, Alistair, she murmured, straightening her wizard stoles. We need to talk about that, among other things. And then, without taking her eyes off his face, she said louder, Master Griffin, dismiss your class. Griffin turned to face the gawking students. Newling Alistair has demonstrated for us all the price of carelessness and arrogance combined with ignorance. Do take note. He paused to let that sink in. For tomorrow, I want two pages from each of you about your experience in Edeon to share with the rest of the class. Class dismissed. The other students collected their things. Han felt the vibration of feet and the touch of eyes as they shuffled out. Fiona didn't move, as if hoping to be overlooked. You too, Fiona, Griffin said. And you, Hayden. Out. Fiona's knees were removed from Han's side as she stood. He heard her walk away, a door opening and closing. I'll wait and see Alistair back to his room, Dancer said. Or heal his hall, wherever he needs to go. Abelard looked up at Dancer, taking in his stubborn expression. She sighed. All right, but step outside a moment, please. We need to speak to Alistair in private. Dancer shook his head, his blue eyes fixed on the dean. I'm not... It's all right, Hans said, waving him off. I'll be fine. He was beginning to feel a little better. A trickle of heat in his middle said his magic was building up again. Abelard waited until the door closed behind Dancer before she spoke. So, Alistair, she said softly, closing her fingers around his wrist. Tell me about it. Power flowed into him. It was hard to resist, depleted as he was. Tell you about what? Han asked. When she continued to stare down into his face, he said, All I remember is, I felt dizzy, and then I must have passed out. I don't think anything really happened. Magical, I mean. Alistair partnered with the copperhead that was just here, Griffin said. His friend returned after a few minutes, but Alistair stayed until I dragged him back by force. He was using power like mad. He drained his amulet almost completely. Abelard frowned. 
How long was he gone? The master hesitated. About fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes? Abelard straightened and stared at Griffin. He's a newling, Master Griffin. A child, magically speaking. Why didn't you put a stop to it sooner? Griffin looked like he wished he could get out from under Abelard's flinty gaze. I had partnered with another student since there was an odd number in the class. You should know better than that, Abelard exploded. How can you supervise the students if you're attempting travel in Edeon yourself? Griffin held the dean's gaze. It was irresponsible, a mistake on my part. He paused. It will not happen again, I assure you. Abelard turned to Han. Did Master Griffin warn you about the consequences of staying too long? Abelard asked. The way she said it, Han wasn't sure who was on trial, him or Griffin. Han shifted on the hard floor. He told us to come right back. Did he tell you why it was so important to return quickly? Abelard continued. Han looked at Griffin, whose gaze was fixed on the ceiling. We talked about it. If you drain your amulet, it's hard to come back. If you drain your amulet, you cannot come back, Abelard said. You remain in the dream world forever, while your body lies abandoned. You are dead. Well, that was news. Han felt a little queasy. So you believe in what Kenley says about the dream world? I mean, it sounds like most people don't even think it exists. Abelard nodded. I believe travel in Edeon is rare, but possible. It could be a very useful tool if we could master it. The dean fingered a strand of her silver hair. We do this exercise every fall with the first years. When the students report tomorrow, most will have tried and failed. Some will make up stories suggesting success. Others, non-believers, won't have even tried. But every so often we encounter students like you and Hayden who succeed. Most are smart enough to follow directions. Your friend closed the portal on his own and returned. You stayed in Edeon too long. That's a dangerous business, Alistair. What makes you think I succeeded? Han asked, feeling pinned under the gaze of the dean and the master. You were using prodigious amounts of power, Abelard said. Her sharp, pointed face wore a hungry look that Han mistrusted. Your amulet is depleted. Maybe it was because I didn't know what I was doing, Han said. When in doubt, experience had taught him to deny and keep denying. I didn't do the reading. When my charm didn't work, I just kept having at it. I guess I lost track of time. You claim you didn't go anywhere, Abelard said. Not that I remember, Han said. Abelard scowled at him, rolling her eyes. Han was usually a rum liar, but he couldn't seem to amuse these two. Whatever happened, Griffin said fiercely, you need to follow my directions or you're out of here. Master Griffin is right, Abelard said. If you persist in taking chances, endangering yourself and others, I will have you expelled and your amulet confiscated. Do you understand me? Han closed his hand around his amulet. You can try, he thought, gazing at her straight on. To his surprise, Abelard smiled. I don't know that name. Alistair, she said, giving him another good look over. And your speech is unusual. Where do you live? What is your house? Perhaps I know your family. I'm from Ragmarket, Hans said. Once he got started, the words just tumbled out. Used to live on Cobble Street over the stable before it burnt down. I'm sort of between houses now since my family's dead. My ma'am was Sally Allister. My sister's name was Mary. Ma'am was mostly in laundry, but her sideline was rag picking. Heard of them? Wordlessly. Abelard shook her head. You will, Han said, looking the dean in the eyes. Abelard cleared her throat. 
It's possible that your amulet was responsible for your success, she said. She reached out and fingered the serpent flash cautiously, as if it might bite. It must have been totally drained of power, since it didn't react to her touch at all. Han shivered, resisting the temptation to snatch it out of her hand. It was as though she'd reached into his chest and took hold of his heart. Where did you get this? Abelard leaned in close. I bought it in the clan markets, second hand, Han said. I thought it might be a custom piece, the dean said. One with extra capabilities, since you're so friendly with the copperheads. That would explain a lot. You think I could afford a custom piece? Han said. Friends is friends, until it comes to a trade. That's how it works in the markets. Not many charm casters would choose a piece of this design, Abelard said. She paused. Do you know who else carried an amulet like this? I got no idea, Han lied. He felt weary and besieged, stripped of his usual charm. It's a reproduction of the amulet carried by the Demon King, she said. Han produced a look of surprise. Huh, maybe that's why it went so cheap. Do you have a special interest in dark magic, Alistair? Is that it? Her voice was velvety soft. I want to learn about all kinds of magic, Han said. That's why I'm here. There are those who will make assumptions about you based on that amulet, Alistair, she said. People who believe that all pathways should be open to those who seek knowledge. Those that believe that the end justifies the means. Abelard stood abruptly, so that now she was towering over him, a black silhouette against the light from the windows. She bent and reached her hands down to help him up and settle him down into a chair. She was surprisingly strong. Call in his partner, she murmured to Griffin. Griffin called, Newling Hayden. When Dancer came back in from the corridor, Abelard said, Hayden. Alistair and I have been talking about his experiences in Edeon. What do you remember? Dancer's eyes flicked from Han to Abelard, as if he suspected he was walking into a trap. Han tried to send him a message with his eyes. Well, Dancer said, I don't remember much. Blood and bones of the Demon King, Abelard exploded. Just tell me what you do remember. When Dancer glanced at Han again, Abelard gripped Dancer's chin and wrenched his head around. Look at me, Newling. Dancer fingered his amulet as if for reassurance. Beforehand, we agreed to meet back home, in a place we know on Hanalia. So we... What would you know about Hanalia? Abelard interrupted. It is forbidden for wizards to go there. I was born on Hanalia, Dancer said calmly. Your spirit clan, aren't you? Abelard said as if she hadn't been talking behind his back. I've never seen any gifted come out of the camps before. I'm mixed blood, Dancer said without elaborating. So, after I spoke the charm, I saw Han walking toward me. He was kind of flickering, like someone you see by firelight, and his clothes kept changing. He paused. I guess I must have been dreaming. And? Abelard prompted. Then what happened? Well, we talked some. Then I, uh, woke up. The dean's eyes narrowed. But Alistair didn't return with you? Dancer shook his head. When I opened my eyes, Han was slumped over the table. I waited for him to wake up. Everyone else was awake, except Micah Bayar and Master Griffin. Fiona went to find you. Then Master Griffin woke and came to help. Abelard reached toward Dancer's amulet, and it brightened in response. She drew her hand back again. Unlike Alistair, you've not totally depleted your amulet. You were either smart enough to follow directions, or you never went there at all. She smiled a brittle smile. Alistair, I often work with exceptional students, 
even newlings. Plan to meet me in my office four weeks from today. I'll see what I can find out about you in the meantime. She walked to the podium and picked up the Kinley, rifling through it. It was their signal to leave so she could have a solitary chat with Griffin. Bones, Han thought. What could the dean find out about him in a month? And what would she do with that information? Hayden, take Alistair back to his room and see that he rests a while, Griffin said. He'll need to restore power to his amulet before class tomorrow. Don't forget your pages. And may I suggest you both do the reading for next time? He called after them as they walked toward the door. As they crossed the grassy quad, Dancer kept one hand under Han's elbow, steadying him. Han pulled free. I'll live, he said. You're cold as the dern water, you know that, right? Dancer said. You're always hotter than me, but there's nothing there. He shook his head in amazement. Was it real? Han asked, scuffling through a pile of leaves. Did we really meet on Old Woman Creek? Dancer nodded, looking sideways at him. You said Cat was sweet on me. And you said Fiona Bayar lusted after me. Han raised an eyebrow. She does, Hans alone, Dancer said, grinning. Truly. So Abelard wants to work with me and not you, Han said. I wonder what that's about. I'm a copperhead, Dancer said. That's what it's about. He rolled his eyes. I'm not exactly heartbroken. If she teaches me anything useful, I'll pass it along, Han said. They walked in silence for a few paces. Did you see anything else, Han asked, before you close the portal? Dancer shook his head. Like what? Somebody else showed up, just as you left. A blue blood wizard a little older than us. Called himself Crow. You didn't see him? Dancer shrugged. No. Was it someone from class? I didn't recognize him, but he had to have been from mist work anyway, Han said. He said he was faculty here. How would he find us on Hanalia? Don't you have to be able to visualize a place before you visit it in Edeon? Dancer said. Han shrugged. I got no idea. I don't know how this works. But maybe somebody overheard us saying we were meeting there. Maybe I should go back and read the text, he thought. So what happened? Dancer said. Did he say anything? Han remembered what Crow had said. Do not tell a soul about this. No reason he had to do as Crow commanded. He said he wanted to partner up with me against the Bayars. He offered to teach me magic. Then Griffin yanked me back. Dancer looked at Han for a long moment, his brows drawn together. Finally, he said, Well, you were lucky, Hanselone. Fiona went after Abelard because Griffin and Micah were out almost as long as you. We were beginning to think nobody was coming back. I was about ready to open the portal and go back after you when they woke up. Griffin rushed over and revived you. Huh, Han said. Well, if Griffin really went to Edeon, he must be stoked then. He still had plenty of power on board, and I was nearly out. How did you leave it with Crow, then? Dancer asked. Hans snorted. I didn't say one way or the other, but I ain't a fool. Seems chancy to take lessons from someone I don't know in a place where I don't know the rules. Just like Odin's Ford, he thought. The bells in Mistwork Tower sounded the end of the first class period, meaning they had fifteen minutes to walk downriver to their next class at Healer's Hall. Something about amulets and talismans. I'll walk you back to Hampton and then go on to class, Dancer said. I ain't going back to Hampton, Hans said, turning onto the gallery along the river. I don't want to miss class. We're behind enough already. But Master Griffin said, we won't tell him, all right? but Crow's words still sounded in his mind like a phrase of music he couldn't forget. I can teach you how to use that amulet. I can teach you marvelous things. Chapter 14 Dean's Dinner 
When Han returned to Griffin's class the next day, he made sure he did nothing to call attention to himself. His amulet was still low on power, though he'd stoked it all night long. He kept a hand wrapped around it all morning, and it greedily sucked him dry. His report on his visit to Edeon was as sketchy as anyone's. Griffin smashed his lips together tight, but said nothing after, except, Thank you, Alistair. That is, indeed, a remarkable story. Micah and Fiona provided equally vague reports. Han read and studied Kinley like a fiend, searching for answers. He couldn't ask Griffin because that would only draw the master's attention. After the incident with Abelard, they left the topic of Edeon for good. The master continued to pick on Han in class, regularly descending on him like a predator bird with broken wings and a savage bite. It was as if he blamed Han for getting him into trouble with Dean Abelard. Han stayed up late every night, preparing for class, trying to make himself less vulnerable to attack. The threat of humiliation was incredibly motivating. The rest of the class suffered, too, just not so often as Han. Griffin reduced Darnley to tears, ridiculed the Mander brothers, and treated Dancer like an idiot. Even the Bayars came in for tough questioning at times, though it seemed to Han that Griffin's verbal blade was blunted in their case, especially with Fiona. Twice during the next week, Dean Abelard came into the class and sat at the back of the room. She tapped her fingers on the desk in front of her, her face grim and unsmiling in the faint glow from her amulet. During those sessions, Griffin floundered, often losing his train of thought. Micah and his cousins spent little time at Hampton Hall, so Han rarely saw them except in class. They preferred the Crown and Castle, where they held court nightly with Fiona and Will, and a large crowd of mistwork newlings Micah was tight with. It made sense. Most of Han's class came from the Fells. They'd likely been cozy since childhood. Han forced himself to go into the Crown and Castle now and then, just to make show, even though the tap room went silent when he entered, and Micah's mates made a point of grabbing their purses and guarding their amulets if he came anywhere near. Seven weeks into the term, the newlings were notified that Dean Abelard would host the first Dean's Dinner at Mistwork Hall on Temple Day. All Mistwork students, proficients, and faculty were expected to attend. Han didn't look forward to coming under Dean Abelard's eye again. His face-to-face -face with her was only a week away. He still clung to the frail hope he could get out of it. As Han dressed for dinner, he was glad for the red robe of anonymity he pulled on over his clothes. He'd bathed, scraped the stubble from his face, combed his hair, and shined up his amulet with a chamois. He couldn't think of how else to prepare. Mistwork Hall was ablaze with lights as Han and Dancer walked across the quad, the entryway spattered with red robes. For once, it wasn't raining, though a brisk wind from the north said the weather was changing. Servants wearing Mistwork livery directed them into the great hall. At the front of the room, long tables glittered with plates and cups and silver, more of each than seemed needful when there wasn't even any food set out. Great banners hung from the cavernous ceilings, wizard house emblems, including the familiar stooping falcons of the Bayars. What would his banner be if he had one, Han wondered. Although everyone wore the requisite red robes, most were decorated, with stoles bearing the signia of their wizard houses and with the badges and embroideries denoting their academic ranks. Many wore jewelry beyond their amulets, gaudy rings on their fingers, heavy gold chains and wrist cuffs. Even in his red plumage, Han felt underdressed, like the plainest of sparrows. Han located the Bayars amid a cluster of students on the far side of the room. As he watched, Micah glanced at Han, then said something that set the others to snickering. Fiona was facing Han also, and she looked up and caught his eye. She held his gaze for a long moment, her face as hard and cold as marble, then turned toward Will. Han felt the familiar prickle of danger between his shoulder blades. 
Straying onto blue blood turf was like walking the streets of Southbridge without a gang mark or a reputation to protect you. Touching his amulet for reassurance, he put his street face on. Drinks were on offer at a bar in one corner, so he and Dancer headed that way, sliding past clusters of students and faculty. As they passed, conversation washed over them. Han caught snatches of it. The words rag market and slumlord and copperhead struck his ears like sour notes. Han scanned the array of glittering bottles, casks, and barrels at the bar. Not just ale and cider, but brandy, wine, and whiskey, too. Han thought of Lucius Frowsley, back home on Hanalea, and wondered if his distillery was still in business and who carried product for him now. Han and Dancer both ordered cider. This dinner would be tricky enough to navigate with a clear head. Adam Griffin entered the room in his wheeled chair, maneuvering expertly through the crowd toward the bar. Too bad he can't use that chair all the time, Han thought. But the academy was riddled with steps, curbs, cobblestones, and other hazards. Someone tugged at Han's sleeve, and he spun around, nearly spilling his cider. He faced a girly with extremely pale skin and short-cropped, spiky black hair streaked with wizard red. She wore a red robe sewn over with proficient trim. Her hands were loaded with rings, and much of her visible skin was covered in bright metallic tattoos, like painted-on jewelry. The design seemed to ripple and move on its own. The talismans and wards, the girlie explained, brushing her fingers over a symbol on the back of her hand, to protect against hex magic. Ah, Han said, trying to think of the right thing to say. Is someone trying to hex you? She nodded, then stood on tiptoes so she could stage whisper in his ear. I'm Mordred de Villiers, she said, as if that explained it. I'm Han Alistair, Han said. He nodded toward Dancer. And this is Hayden Fire Dancer. I know, Mordred de Villiers said, looking from one to the other, her eyes wide and solemn. Is it true you're a thief and a murderer? Han just looked at her. There was no trace of judgment in her face, only avid curiosity. When he didn't answer right away, she rushed on. They say you're a notorious criminal and that you tried to murder Lord Bayar. She turned to Dancer. And they say that you are a copperhead spy. Dancer glanced at Han. Who told you that? he asked. Mordra tilted her head toward the Bayar's corner. So, Han rubbed the back of his neck. What do you think? Well, she said, nodding at Dancer. You are a copperhead. She turned to Han. And you sound like a street person, even if you're not dressed like one. She scanned his face. And you do look rather ruthless with all those scars and all. How did he sound like a street person, Han wondered. He hadn't even said that much. Should you be talking to us then, he asked. Could be chancy. Mordra shrugged. They don't think much of me either, because I'm from the Down Realms, even though my bloodline is pure and my father's on the council. Dean Abelard favors me, though, because I have considerable talent. She extended her arm, displaying the trim on her robes. I'm the youngest proficient ever. You must be rum clever, Han said. If you're smart, she'll take notice of you too, Mordra said. Doesn't matter who you are. She glanced at Dancer and shrugged. Unless you're a copperhead, of course. This Mordra may be smart, but she'll say anything that comes into her head, Han thought. Maybe I don't want to be noticed he said. Oh, you want to be, Mordra said. Dean Abelard offers special classes for Mistwork students with potential. What kind of classes? Han asked. Again, Mordra went up on tiptoes, grabbing onto his arm to keep her balance. Forbidden magic, she breathed, her warm breath tickling his ear. Powerful spells. An icy voice cut into their conversation. Shut up, Mordra. 
Startled, Mordra jerked back, nearly falling. Han looked up to see that Fiona had somehow made it all the way across the room without his noticing. You shut up, Mordra said, recovering herself and balling up her fists. You're always spewing nonsense like a newling in his cups, Fiona went on, rolling her eyes. Alistair is a street thug. He has no interest in your pathetic fantasy life. Actually, it was fascinating, Han said. Mordra was just saying that... Never mind, Mordra interrupted. Where are you sitting? Wherever there's room, I guess, Han said. Far from the Bayars and the Dean, he thought to himself. And maybe Mordra, too. She might be the only one willing to talk to him, but her chatter was wearing him out. You're assigned a seat, didn't you know? I'm at the dean's table, Mordra said. How do you know where you're sitting? Han asked. It always seemed like he was missing information that everyone else knew. There are little cards at the places, Mordra said. You should walk around and find yours. It's almost time to sit down. Han's place turned out to be at the dean's table, too, with both Bayars, Adam Griffin, another proficient, and another master. So much for avoiding notice. Dancer was seated at a nearby table with several of the Bayar's crew. They squirmed and leaned away as if he smelled bad. Dancer sighed and put on his traitor face. It was as if the dean had decided to make everybody miserable on purpose. Han was seated between Mordra and Fiona, with Micah across from them, next to Master Griffin. Fiona sat rigid, staring straight ahead, as if she could pretend Han wasn't right next to her. Fortunately, servers arrived in a hurry with soup, ladling it into bowls in front of each person. It was a thin broth with a bit of greens floating in it. Not much of a supper, Han thought, surprised. He'd expected a more lavish spread. Spooning some up, he blew on it to cool it off. It tasted smoky and salty, like dried mushrooms and onions. I hope we get seconds, he thought, or at least some bread to go with. He took a few more bites, then noticed that nobody else was eating. Across the table, Micah gazed at him, fingers templed, one eyebrow raised. Mordra leaned over. You're supposed to wait until everyone is served and the dean has welcomed us she said in a whisper loud enough to be heard at nearby tables. A titter rolled around the room. Han put his spoon down, feeling the blood rush to his face. It turned out that soup wasn't supper. It was what came before supper. Supper was roast quail and potatoes and carrots and little cakes and fruit soaked in brandy set aflame and three different wines and sweet spirits in tiny cups. Nobody else brought their cider to the table. Though he tried to follow along with what others were doing, every so often Han would pick up the wrong fork or eat things in the wrong order or use the wrong sauce on the wrong thing, and Mordra would correct him in her player's whisper, sending the room into silent convulsions of laughter. The only ones not laughing were Dean Abelard, Dancer, Mordra, and Fiona. Fiona? All through dinner she drank wine, but ate very little, pushing the food around her plate with a scowl on her face until the servers took it away. She drummed her fingers on the table and shifted in her seat. Sitting next to me takes away her appetite, Han thought. Several times, Master Griffin leaned across the table and tried to engage Fiona in conversation, but she seemed distracted, as if she scarcely heard him. Finally, she leaned across Han to speak to Mordra. Just stop it, she hissed as Mordra opened her mouth to speak when Han went to butter his roll, likely with the wrong knife. What? Mordra blinked at her. You of all people should not be correcting anyone's manners, Fiona went on, her voice brittle as steel at solstice. You are a disaster. Mordra thrust her chin out. I was just trying to stay away from Alistair, or you'll be more of a pariah than you already are. 
Fiona warned. Both of you shut it, Han exploded, slamming his hands down on the table, rattling the china and sloshing wine out of glasses. It'd be easier to eat in the middle of a tavern brawl than to sit between the two of you. The room went dead silent. Fiona scraped back her chair and stood. Dean Abelard, please excuse me, I'm not feeling well. She swept out of the hall without a backward glance. Han looked across the table to where Micah sat staring at him, eyes narrowed in appraisal. Griffin gazed after Fiona until she disappeared through the doorway, then fixed his uncanny eyes on Han, his face pale and furious. Dean Abelard propped her elbows on the table, resting her chin on her hands, a faint smile curving her lips. Han stopped eating then, too, unwilling to chance more lessons from Mordra. She rattled on, and he answered in short sentences. Finally, the endless dinner was over. Students and faculty collected into chatty groups. Han and Dancer left the hall by the back door in order to avoid contact with anyone. We have to do this every month, Han muttered, the rich meal like an anvil in his middle. Bloody bones. Fiona Bayar and Mordra de Villiers were fighting over you? The wind rattled branches overhead, and Dancer turned his collar up. When Han glared at him, he added, It looked like it to me. I got no idea what that was all about, Han said. Fiona doesn't want anyone to talk to us. Maybe she wants to isolate us more than we already are. Maybe she wants you for herself, Dancer said. Ha! Huh. They walked on in silence for a moment. I wonder who goes to Abelard's classes, Han mused. I wonder what she's up to. As they rounded the side of Mistwork Hall, light flared under the gallery, catching Han's eye. He squinted, making out a robed silhouette amid the shadows, an angular face illuminated from below. Overhead, stone cracked with a boom that set Han's ears to ringing. Without looking up, he launched himself into Dancer, sending both of them flying to a sprawling landing on the grassy quad. Han rolled to his feet. A jumble of roof tiles and broken stone littered the ground where they'd stood moments before. Palming his knife, he charged toward the gallery, running a zigzag course so as to make a difficult target. But nobody was there. What is it? Dancer said, just behind him. What did you see? Han shook his head and put his finger to his lips. He looked back toward the walkway. It appeared that a large second-story gallery had broken off and shattered on the cobblestones. Some of the pieces were bigger than his head, any one of them could have killed them had they struck true. As they watched, a crowd of students and faculty rounded the corner and clustered around the fallen masonry. They didn't notice Han and Dancer hidden in the gloom. Neither of the Bayars were there. Han touched Dancer's shoulder and jerked his head toward their dormitory. All the way back, Han kept his knife in one hand, his amulet in the other, his senses on alert for an ambush along the way. Blevins looked up as they passed through the common room. Dinner over already, he said. Has anyone else come back from dinner? Han asked. Blevins shook his head. You're the first. They climbed the stairs to the fourth floor. Han closed the door at the top of the stairs and rechecked his magical barriers. Soft-footing it down the hallway to his room, he eased the door open. No one there. Crossing to the window, he looked out. Excited voices still floated from the crowd around the rubble near Mistwork Hall. Han turned around to find Dancer in the doorway. Somebody was standing under the gallery on the far side of the quad, Han said. He cast a charm right before the gallery came down on us. Are you sure? Dancer asked. The wind might have loosened one of the cornices. It's been howling all day. Whoever did it wanted it to look like it was the wind, Han said. You didn't see who it was? 
Han shook his head. Somebody tall, in wizard robes. The light from the amulet had momentarily illuminated their attacker's face, but it had extinguished so quickly he couldn't be sure who it was. He had a guess, though. Fiona would have had plenty of time to get into position. Or Micah could have hurried out the front door in time to be waiting for them when they came around the building. They'd been lucky this time, but who knew how long their luck would hold. Chapter 15 Friends and Enemies Eamon did review the roster of students in Wien House and Eisenwork, newling cadets and secondaries, but there were no Alisters listed. Cuffs could have been enrolled under an assumed name, but if he had just arrived at Wien House, surely Raysa or Eamon would have spotted him again in the dining halls or libraries. When that didn't happen, Raysa grudgingly conceded that she'd been mistaken. Just remember, stay off Bridge Street, Eamon said. As weeks went by, Raysa began to relax in her identity as Newling Cadet. She'd never fool anyone who knew her well, but to anyone else, a cadet's tunic and chopped-off hair seemed to be a remarkably good disguise for a princess. She encountered a few of her countrymen in the dining hall and on the quad, but no one recognized her. Tame Askell was as good as his word. The curriculum he and Eamon had cooked up for Raysa kept her running from early morning until she fell into bed exhausted on the top floor of Grindle Hall. Not even Hallie's snoring could keep her awake. She couldn't complain. She'd asked for it. No, demanded it. And now she was paying the price. There were no daydreamy sessions of stitchery or chamber music or painting landscapes in the garden. There were no lazy afternoons gossiping over tea on the terrace. There was no terrace. The lack of a dorm master at Grindle Hall might have encouraged rule-breaking, but they were all too exhausted for that. As fourth-year commander, Eamon strictly enforced curfew on his fellow cadets, though he was rarely on the premises himself. Raysa was always half asleep by curfew anyway, trying to read a few more pages before she doused her candle. Some nights she did fall asleep, draped across her desk, her face mashed into the pages of her history book. Maybe some of it would soak in through her skin. She stayed off Bridge Street, even though she was sorely tempted when Talia and Hallie invited her to go out with them. She told herself she didn't have time to go to taverns anyway. At least that way she could avoid Talia's relentless matchmaking. She quickly grew to dread her recitation in the history of warfare. Lectures by the masters and deans were scheduled three times a week, with recitations every day. The recitations were moderated by proficients, who led discussions and administered oral and written examinations. So they had a lot of power, especially over newlings. Her history recitation was led by an Ardenine proficient named Henri Torrent. A younger son of a thane, Tarant had apparently decided that an academic post provided opportunities he wouldn't have at home. Opportunities to bully and humiliate students during the day and pursue other pleasures at night. Tarant was a tyrant, and he had a typical Ardenine attitude toward women, arrogant and condescending. He made his opinion clear early on. Women should be enrolled elsewhere, not wasting the time of the faculty in Wien House and the other more manly academies. A thousand years since the breaking, and Arden still couldn't seem to get over the fact that they had once been ruled by a woman. Tarant was a small man, in stature and in every other way. He had thin, cruel lips and curling brown hair that he wore long. It was already thinning on top, though he was only a few years older than Raysa. His face was rather reptilian, with a receding chin and a pointed nose. He was also something of a dandy, and often removed his scholar's robes to display his finery. Tarant strutted back and forth at the front of the classroom, doing most of the talking during what was supposed to be a discussion. He rarely stayed on topic and seemed to have only a nodding acquaintance with the facts. 
A real discussion would have been helpful, but Tarant's recitation was a waste of time. Raisa mostly sat in the back row and did homework, but today the topic was magic in warfare, and she had trouble keeping her mind occupied elsewhere and her mouth shut when Tarant rattled on, spewing misinformation like a broken waste pipe. I'm learning self-restraint, Raisa thought, keeping her clenched fists hidden in her lap. A valuable skill. It got worse. A rather wild-eyed temple dedicate from Arden proclaimed that the demon eye warriors went into battle naked. Though they're fabulously rich, the northern savages wear all of their wealth as jewelry, the dedicate went on. They fight in the nude, save for massive gold collars and bracelets that proclaim their status, and quivers for their arrows. Now that is something I would like to see. Tarant said, grinning. His gaze slid over Raisa, cold and nasty as a demon's kiss. You're a half-blood, Morley, right? Ever go into battle naked? Is the idea to distract the enemy? Raisa pushed away an image of Reed Nightwalker galloping through the trees in the buff. If you think about it, sir, you'll realize that can't be true, she said, choosing each word before she spit it out. Anyone who goes naked in the mountains would be cold and uncomfortable, even in summer. In a northern winter, he would freeze to death. They are accustomed to the cold, the dedicate said. They don't even feel it. We are accustomed to the cold, Raisa said, much more than flatlanders, but there are limits. The clans are famous for their metalsmithing, so they do wear jewelry, but they also wear leather and fur and woven fabrics, too, she said, recalling the great looms in constant use in the lodges. Some say the savages grow heavy fur in the winter, like wolves, Torrant said, as if it were a matter of real debate among scholars. That's why they call them the Wolf Queens. This was met by a scattering of laughter, but many of the students shifted uncomfortably in their seats. Is that true, Newling Morley? That's not true. A statuesque girl with coppery skin and a tamaric accent spoke up without being called upon. She wore eisenwork robes and elaborate jewelry. My family deals with clan traders all the time. The one who calls on us is well-educated and fully clothed. Certainly not a savage, though he does drive a hard bargain. Well now, Newling Haddam, Tarrant said, winking at her. Sounds like you're sweet on him. When you say he drives a hard bargain, what exactly does that mean? Haddam flushed angrily and opened her mouth to speak, but Tarrant pointed at another student who was eagerly waving his hand. Gutmark, what do you think? The queens of the fells are witches, a solemn boy from Bruinswallow said. They charm the men into letting them rule. The queens of the fells rule for the same reason that the kings of Tamron and Bruinswallow rule, Racer said. Bloodlines, history, education, and ability. There's demon magic in the northern mountains, a southern islander said. That's where the demon king come from, and that's where he died. And his bones, they infect the land to this day. The soil blisters your feet, and plants just wither in the ground. Plants grow there, Raisa said. Just not the same plants that grow here. Where do you think all your medicines and scents come from? Sorcery, the Ardenine dedicate said, with a pious shudder. I wouldn't wear those wicked perfumes. They cloud the mind and lead to sins of the flesh. After I graduate, I'm going to be a missionary. I'm going to go and live with the mountain savages and help civilize them and bring them the true faith, she said. Raisa tried to imagine this naive girl facing off with her father, Avril Lightfoot, Lord Demon Eye, and attempting to civilize him. Her grandmother, the matriarch Elena Sinestre, would devour her alive. Well, good luck to you, Raisa said, rolling her eyes, then flinched as a voice boomed from the back of the room. Proficient Torrent, have you ever been to the fells? Everyone swiveled to find Master Askell standing in the back of the lecture hall. 
Tarrant colored. No, sir, it's hardly a place I would— Who has been to the fells? Askell said, looking down over the rows of seats. Stand up. Raisa slid out of her chair and stood. She was the only one. No one else? Not even briefly, Askell said. Everyone stared at the floor. Anyone have friends, relatives, business associates from the north? This time, Haddam stood in a rustle of fabric, glaring at Tarrant. Askell sighed. Sit down, Morley and Haddam. They did. As master of Wean House and faculty here at Odensford, I like to think that I play the most important role in your education. But that's not true. What makes Odensford so effective is the diversity of its students, who come from all over the Seven Realms. Smart cadets will embrace this opportunity. They will shut up and listen to the experts among them, those who speak from personal experience. In future, whether you meet them again in war or peace, you'll be better prepared to do your job. Those that rely on evidence will succeed. Those that embrace myths, innuendo, and rumor will fail. Do you understand? Yes, sir, rolled through the hall. Askell smiled faintly. Carry on, proficient Tarrant, he said, then turned and walked out the door. Raisa turned back in time to catch Tarrant's poisonous glare. Well, she thought, I've made an enemy. After that, she saw a lot more of Master Askell in her classes, especially the recitations. Raisa would notice a shift in Tarrant's attitude and demeanor, and look up from her note-taking to find the master leaning against the back wall of the classroom. She'd turn away from the chalkboard in her finance class, and Askell would be conferring with her teacher in the back of the room. At the end of language recitation, she'd spot him sitting among the students and wonder how long he'd been there. He would often slip in unnoticed during the heat of discussion or in the midst of an oral examination. He'd leave again when he'd seen whatever it was he'd come to see. Race's performance in the physical part of soldiering continued to improve, but she realized she'd never be adept at it. She was too small and lightweight for most flatland weapons, even though she'd been remade with a layer of muscle. She was a decent archer and a skilled rider. She excelled at geography, wayfinding, and survival skills, courtesy of her training in the camps. She was also good at finance, a benefit of her time in the clan markets. She liked sharing a room with Hallie and Talia. As they spent more time together, they began to treat her more like a peer and less like a breakable object. Hallie seemed like a grown-up compared to her fellow wolves. She was big, loud, strong, and gregarious, but she would go silent and sad when conversation turned to her daughter. She had a small sketch of Asha that she pulled out and studied several times a day, as if afraid she'd forget what her daughter looked like. She sent letters every week and small gifts, never knowing if they reached their destination. Raisa asked Hallie to see Asha's picture one night when they were both up late, studying for exams. She's beautiful, Raisa said, examining the drawing of a solemn-looking girl with enormous blue eyes and a halo of fine, pale hair. Who did the drawing for you? It was Corporal Byrne's sister, Lydia. He asked her to make it when I signed up for school and joined the wolves. It must have been a hard decision, coming here, I mean, Raisa said. Hallie shrugged. I was in the regular army, the Highlanders, when I found out I was expecting. She looked at Raisa. I am a fool. I was taking maidenweed, but it's hard to keep a schedule when you're in the army, traveling all the time. I came home to have my girl, but I needed to work to support her. All I know is soldiering, but I hated going back to the army because I'd be away from her all the time. I thought of joining the Blue Jackets, but you need schooling for that these days. She hesitated, as if deciding how much to share. I thought I'd have a try and find a good street lord, join a crew. Only, if anything happens to me, Ashes on her own. I keep her and my mam and pap both. These people make gut-wrenching choices every day, Raisa thought. 
and I thought life among the working class was simple. Then Speaker Jemson at Southbridge Temple said there was something called the Briar Rose Ministry, Halley went on. He said he could get me money to pay my fees at Wean House if I could get in. The Briar Rose Ministry? Race's head came up. Really? Impulsively, she gripped Halley's hands. Oh, that's wonderful news. Halley squinted at Raysa, tilting her head. Well, right. So you can guess the rest. I got in and here I am. And every temple day I buy a rose from the flower girl on the bridge and leave it on the altar for the Princess Raysa. And when I get back home, I hope I'll be assigned to her service. I can be with Asha and I can keep the lady safe. Maybe it will happen, Raysa said, clearing her throat. Maybe it will. Hallie tucked Asha's picture away. In class, Raysa studied battle strategies developed by Gideon Byrne centuries ago. Lila Byrne had designed the prototype of a double-edged rapier that was still in use today. Dwight Byrne had made innovative use of mounted soldiers at a time when the cavalry had fallen into disuse. Raysa and Eamon had this in common. They both felt the pressure of being the living heirs of an ancient dynasty of accomplishment. Eamon was skilled with weapons and performed well in his coursework, but he wasn't the biggest or strongest or richest of the cadets in his class at Odin's Ford. He didn't win over his classmates by buying ales and ciders for them on Bridge Street, then staggering home arm in arm with them in the small hours. He radiated a calm focus, like he knew who he was and where he was going. He was a steady mooring in a sea of change. He was honest, and he kept his word, and he was unrelentingly fair. It made people want to follow him. I can learn from him, Raysa thought. I tend to stir people up, not settle them down. Eamon continued to train her in sticking, using the staff Dimitri had given her. Some days it was all she saw of Eamon. He left the dormitory before she crawled out of bed, and she was usually fast asleep when he came home. As class commander, he attended endless meetings and participated in the governance of the school. That was the story, anyway. It still seemed to Raysa that he avoided being alone with her. Yet sometimes she'd look up, even at dinner, and find those gray eyes fixed on her. I thought this place was called the Great Leveler, she said to Eamon as she closed the book on another long day. It was now eight weeks into the term, the most exhilarating and exhausting eight weeks of her life. Eamon looked up from his engineering drawing. It is. Then why did Master Askell agree to put us all in the same dormitory? And why did he approve a special curriculum for me if everyone's treated equally? They are, Eamon said, until they're not. He returned to his work until the pressure of her glare made him look up again. He sat back, rolling his quill between his fingers. It had become a habit. Master Askell knows who you are, he said. I told him. Raysa nearly spit out her tea. What? Aren't you the one who said it was so important that nobody know who I am? Eamon nodded. Right, it is but I needed to convince him that we should all stay here in Grindle Hall, which is against policy. Though you're technically a first year, I wanted you in with fourth years. The quill landed on the floor, and he bent down to get it. I didn't want to be lying awake at night, wondering if you were safe in a dormitory across campus. I wanted someone in authority to know, in case this goes wrong. You trust him? I, I trust him. Raysa recalled her interview with Master Askell. That's why he gave me such a hard time. He expected me to be temperamental and demanding. Eamon nodded. Right. He only agreed to what you wanted because he expected you to wash out right away. He grinned, looking pleased with himself. He doesn't know you like I do. He's been coming to some of my classes, Raysa said. He does that all the time anyway but especially if he has a question about a particular student. Eamon hesitated, 
then plunged on. Tame Askel is the heir to a noble Ardenine family. Remember when he asked you if you'd run away to join the army? That's exactly what he did. He sailed across the Indio to Carthus and fought in the wars over there, working his way up from foot soldier. When he came back to the Seven Realms, he decided he needed schooling to become an officer. He came here. My da was his class commander. Askell thought my da was a jumped-up cake-eater, promoted beyond his abilities. Da thought Askell was an arrogant know-it-all who should shut up and learn something. So what happened? Risa asked. Da never said, but the story goes they met off campus to fight it out and beat each other up pretty bad. Then Askell shut up and learned something, and he and Da wrote a book about the Carthian Wars that helped Askell get a teaching job here later on. It's in the library if you want to take a look. What was it like coming here to school under Askell? Rasa asked. He gave me hell the first two years, Eamon said, grinning. I saw a lot of him in my classes, too. But it ended with him making me class commander. Chapter 16 A Meeting with the Dean In the days following the Dean's dinner, Han was so focused on charm casting that he fell behind in his other classes. He had to prioritize with so much to learn. He was especially keen to learn charms that would keep buildings from falling on him. Because there were newlings, the Bayars, the Manders, and Han shared every class. They were a constant distraction. The class on healing seemed useless to Han. The clans had hired him to kill, not to heal, and the people Han would have liked to heal were already dead. Master Leontis was a gifted, middle-aged healer with missionary zeal and a shiny bald head who did his best to interest his students in his chosen profession. It was a tough sell. Most charm casters were weaned on power and privilege, not tender-hearted to start and poor Leontis was cursed with relentless honesty. Gifted healers take on the illnesses and injuries of their patients. This involves considerable pain, suffering, and expenditure of power. Leontis paused and looked over his spectacles. But there are strategies that can be used to minimize the damage to your body and regain strength after a healing session. With proper care and education, there is no reason why a gifted healer cannot achieve a normal lifespan. As Leontis rambled on about the sacrifices and rewards of the healing trade, his students daydreamed about more appealing topics, or did their homework for other subjects. Han's attention repeatedly strayed during lecture and recitation. The lectures on amulets, talismans, and magical materials were delivered by a wizened old clansman named Fulgrim Firesmith. Firesmith reminded Han of the insect carcasses he sometimes found along the trails in summer, brown, crispy, and shriveled. Creation of magical objects was the province of the clans, outside the abilities of wizards. So it was more of a history class than anything else a survey of magical devices of the long-ago past compared to those available today. It only stoked the frustration of students who resented the limitations of modern magical tools. Firesmith's lectures were terminally boring, yet hard to ignore. Firesmith was deaf as a post, so he yelled out his lectures full volume. He taught from an ancient text so fragile that he had the students parade past to view its yellowed pen and ink drawings rather than risk lifting it from its stand. Han felt a relentless urgency, an impatient desire to focus on material that could be immediately applied. He already had a powerful amulet. He wanted to know more about the charms and hexes that would enable him to use it. He would have preferred to double up on the charm-casting classes and forget the rest. Not that he fancied spending more time with Griffin. His mind kept drifting to Crow and his offer of mentorship. Learning spell-casting from Crow seemed far more appealing than suffering under Griffin. 
if Crow could be trusted. Dancer, however, seemed fascinated with Firesmith and his dusty old books. He scribbled lines and lines of notes and asked detailed questions about theory and craft until Fiona rolled her eyes and smothered yawns behind her hand. Are you really interested in all that? Han asked Dancer as they crossed the quad for the midday. It was raining again, a dreary, cold downpour from a fish-belly sky. A bone-chilling wind drove raindrops into their faces like needles of ice. I couldn't stay awake. There's so much to learn, and there's nothing practical we can do with that. I am interested, Dancer said, scuffling through soggy leaves. Remember? Before all this happened, I'd hoped to apprentice to Elena Sinestra to be a flash metalsmith. I know. Han swung around to watch a pretty girly splash across the lawn, laughing, lifting her skirts to expose a fine pair of legs. She ducked under one of the galleries and disappeared. He turned back to Dancer. Have you ever made anything magical? Dancer nodded. When I was younger, simple pieces, but they seemed to work. But now you're a charm caster, Han said, and wizards can't... I'm still clan. Dancer said, lifting his chin. I don't care what the demon I say. I haven't given up on my chosen vocation. But how would you learn to work with magical materials? Han said. Elena won't teach you, even if you have the gift of flash metal smithing. Firesmith says the library here has the best collection of texts on magical materials in the Seven Realms, Dancer said. They climbed the steps to the dining hall, taking shelter under the porch roof. Dancer shook his head, flinging water in all directions, then stepped to the side, out of earshot of the other students streaming into the hall. But clan artists learn by apprenticeship, Han said. Firesmith won't teach you either, if he knows what you're up to. He doesn't want to know what I'm up to, Dancer said. He's thrilled to have a student that's actually interested I signed up for a special project with him next term. Stuffing his hands in his pockets, he strode on. I'll teach myself if I have to. Dancer has a hard spine in him that would be easy to overlook, Han thought. He chooses his battles and plays to win. Just then, a southern islander in temple dress spotted them. She broke away from a group of her fellow students and strode across the porch toward them. It was Cat Tyburn, but Han might not have recognized her had she not opened her mouth. Her mass of wiry curls had been tamed down and woven into a long plait that fell over her left shoulder. She wore white trousers and a long white over-tunic split up each side for easier walking. She was cleaner than Han had ever seen her, except for the stained leather belt she'd strapped on over top, her knife jammed into it. She still wore silver in her ears and nose and on her fingers. Between that and her blade scars and the thief marks on her hands, it was an odd marriage of sacred and profane. They hadn't seen her in two weeks, though not for lack of trying. Several times they'd visited the temple dormitory, but had been told she was unavailable. And she hadn't come to see them either. Han stumbled into speech. Cat, you... Uh, you're... I don't think I've ever... What happened to you? They stuck me in a bath, and while I was scrubbing off, they stole my clothes and left me with these. She tugged at the hem of her tunic. They told me I had to stay sequest... Hold up in the temple school for a fortnight and think about my vocation. She made a face. It don't take that long. It's not like I got a lot of choices. As they got into line in the dining hall, Kat continued her litany of complaints. The sun ain't even up when this bell starts clanging and we get out of bed and go to morning meditations. Then it's bells, 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 and class, class, class all day, for hours, reading and writing and mathematics. She pinched two apples and an orange off the line and stuffed them into her carry bag. After lunch is better. There's music class and dance and drawing. Ladling soup into bowls, they carried them to a long table.
Cat used her belt knife to whack off hunks of brown bread from a loaf in the center of the table. I liked the school at Southbridge. You only had to go when you felt like it. How often did you feel like it? Dancer asked, dunking his bread into his bowl. I was there near every month, Cat said, slathering her bread with butter. She means once a month, on the day they gave out cinnamon bread, Hans said, and received a scowl from Cat. You ain't been there for years, Cat retorted. Not since you was street lord. Well, he'd been there the one time. He'd been beaten half to death by Mac Gillen and his blue jackets, and had taken refuge with Speaker Jemson in the temple. Corporal Byrne had tried to take him prisoner, and Han took Rebecca Morley hostage. It seemed a lifetime ago. I'm not used to sitting in a classroom either, Dancer said. In the camps, we learn by apprenticeship, one teacher, one student. Why'd you come here then? Cat asked, keeping her eyes fixed on her bowl. I ain't seen no other copperheads here. They don't teach clan vocations here, Dancer said. There'd be no point. Cat shrugged. From what I heard, you all spend your time stealing babies, hexing animals into monsters, and making poisons and witch pieces. She licked butter off her bread. It's no wonder people don't like it when you come down to the flatlands. Shut up, Cat, Han growled. Don't rattle on about things you know nothing about. The clans are gifted in magical materials, healing, and earth magic, Dancer said to Cat. High magic, the kind wizards use. That's not a clan vocation. That's why I had to come here. His face remained untroubled, as if Cat's digs and insults slid right off him. Some people say Southern Islanders ought to stay in the islands, Han said, feeling the need to stick up for Dancer, since he wouldn't stick up for himself. We all gotta make the best of it. There must be something about the temple school you like. Cat gnawed on her fingernail. I do like the music, she said grudgingly. All you want, there's basilkas and flutes and harps and organs and harpsichords, choirs singing recitals all the time. Mistress Johanna gave me another basilka all to myself, said I could keep it as long as I'm at school. She said they got masters can give me lessons on any of the other instruments, too. My choice. She crammed a handful of grapes into her mouth. She keeps pestering me to do some recitals, play in front of people. I don't know if I want to do that. That Mistress Johanna is smart, Han thought, if she already figured out that the way to Cat was through music. You've been accepted and come this far, Dancer said. You should take advantage. I'd love to hear you play. Cat twitched irritably, twisting a lock of her hair between her thumb and forefinger. I just don't know how long I'm going to be here. No point in getting all tangled up in something that won't last. People begin to think they own a piece of you. Han flung his napkin onto the table. There's nothing you're in a rush to get back to, is there? That's why we're all here. We got nothing and nobody at home. You got no idea who I am or why I'm here, Cat said. She stood and stalked out of the dining hall. That's true enough, Han said, looking after her, shaking his head. He turned to Dancer. You don't have to put up with her ragging about the clans, you know. She's all right. It's nothing worse than what I've heard in the Vale. Dancer pushed his bowl away. Want to go to the library now? Han shook his head. Later. After dinner, maybe. I'm going to stop by Hampton and drop off my books. Then I have to go see Abelard. He rolled his eyes. I ain't looking forward to that. Han crossed the quad to Hampton Hall. The dormitory seemed deserted, all the students either in the dining hall or in class. He loped up the four flights of stairs to the top floor. When he reached the landing, a stench hit his nose. Excrement. Pressing his sleeve over his face, he looked up and down the corridor. The door to his room stood open. Drawing his blade, he soft-footed down the hallway his other hand planted firmly on his amulet. 
Keeping his body canted to one side, he eased his head around the doorframe and looked into his room. It had been completely trashed. His clothing had been dragged out of his trunk and sliced to pieces. His books yanked from the shelf and shredded. His lamp smashed on the floor, the oil soaking into the wood. His bedclothes were ripped from his bed, torn apart and scattered. It appeared that a number of brimming chamber pots had been dumped on top. A gout of anger flamed up in him. The protective charms he'd laid had done no good whatsoever, and he knew exactly who was responsible. Someone who knew Han would be down in the dining hall. Someone Han didn't remember seeing there. Micah's words came back to him. I know where you live, Alistair, and I've got plenty of time. Turning, he swung around the corner into the stairwell, heading for Micah Bayar's rooms on the second floor. Two steps down, he tripped and went flying, head over heels down the stairs, slamming into the wall at the bottom of the first flight and bouncing down a second flight of stairs. Han should have been dead, but he knew how to take a fall. He bounced once or twice on the way down, which slowed him down some, and he managed to wrap his arms around his head before landing painfully on his right shoulder on the landing at the bottom, his head hanging over the top step. He'd narrowly missed tumbling down the third and final flight. His knife flew out of his hand and landed with a ping down below. He blacked out momentarily. When he came to, the wind was totally knocked out of him, and black spots swam before his eyes. His right arm was numb, his shoulder aflame with pain. Blood trickled into his eyes from a gash on his forehead. Han heard footsteps approaching, but for the moment he couldn't move. Is he dead? somebody asked, his voice trembling with fear and excitement. He's got to be. I never thought... He really landed hard. Han recognized his voice. The thin mander, Arcada. Let's hurry before somebody comes. Someone bent over him, groping at his neckline. The plush mander, Miphis. Don't touch it, a third person muttered in fell speech. Roll him over and lift it by the chain. Unmistakably Micah Bayar. The spots cleared and Han saw a pair of fine blue blood boots next to his head. He grabbed the groper's calf with his good hand and yanked. Miphis shrieked and went down, thudding down the last flight, landing hard on the stone floor at the bottom. Han screamed like a mad tom, curling his body protectively around his amulet. He heard swearing, running feet, doors slamming, Blevins bellowing out questions that grew louder as he got closer until he was kneeling next to Han and screeching in his ear. Great hounds of the demon boy, what happened to you? Han spit out blood from his bitten tongue along with a fragment of tooth. Rolling onto his side, he sat up, cradling his right arm close to his body, supporting his elbow with his left hand. The black spots returned as the weight of his arm pulled on his collarbone. Leaning back against the banister, Han said through bloody lips, Fell down the stairs. I told you boys not to race up and down them steps, Levin said. They got loose boards and they're all different sizes. It's lucky you didn't break your fool neck. Yeah, Han thought. Lucky me. He looked up toward the third floor, down to the first, though moving his head was painful. The staircase was empty save for him and Blevins. Miphis had managed to get up then and leave on his own. Did you see anyone else on the stairs? Blevins shook his head. No. Why? The dorm master mopped at Han's forehead with a filthy handkerchief. Someone made a mess of my room. I was... Coming to tell you. Blevin's face flushed pink-purple. You boys gotta learn that pranking just leads to misery, you hear me? You gotta work these things out among yourselves. The message was, don't count on me to intervene. Not that Han expected or wanted it. He was used to fighting his own battles. This is more than a prank, 
Han thought. And I'll find a way to stop it myself. I have to if I'm going to survive. Could you find my knife? Han asked. I think it's down below. It was knocked loose when I fell. The doormaster descended the steps, returning a few minutes later with Han's knife. Han slid it into its sheath and eased to his feet, still leaning against the railing. Anything broke? Blevins asked. My collarbone, maybe. Han trailed off, mumble-minded from the pain. Blevins grabbed Han's left elbow as if he thought he might fall. We got to get you to Healer's Hall, then. Let's hope Master Leontis isn't out this evening. Just a minute. I want to take a look, see if there's a loose board or something. Over Blevins's protests, Han hauled himself back up the stairs, gritting his teeth against the pain in his shoulder and arm. Ah, someone had stretched a heavy cord knee-high across the stairs just below the fourth floor landing, where a person wouldn't see it if he was in a rush. Drawing his knife, he cut it free and stuffed it into his pocket before he went back down to Blevins. What I thought, Han said, loose board. Fortunately, Master Leontis was in his office. It was very different from the Matriarch's Lodge. There were none of the bundles of herbs and jars of unguents that Willow kept handy. No tools for extracting the essences of plants. No patients convalescing in back rooms. Everything was scrubbed up and orderly, plain and empty, save a shelf of books of healing charms. Peculiar. The wizard healer diagnosed a broken collarbone, a fractured cheekbone, a split scalp, and various bumps and bruises. Blevins left to tell Dean Abelard that Han Alistair was with Leontis and so wouldn't be able to make their appointment. That was one bit of good out of it anyway. Like they said about summer fever, it might kill your friends and family, but it was bound to kill off some enemies, too. But Abelard sent back word that she wanted to see him anyway, soon as he was done. Han laid back on a table so Leontis's proficient could wash the blood out of his hair and clean out the wound in his forehead. It had bled like crazy, but he'd had worse. One more scar to add to the collection. Blue Bloods back in Felsmarch hired wizard healers, but they never set foot in Ragmarket. Being healed by wizardry was a peculiar business. Leontis laid hands on Han's collarbone, and a cool flow of magic seemed to wash the pain away. Han felt better and better while Leontis looked worse and worse. The wizard paused when Han guessed they were about evens. How do you feel, my boy? Leontis asked, trying for hardiness. He'd lost color, his eyes clouded, and his skin glistened with sweat. Maybe not perfect, but... You did a rum job, thanks. Han felt guilty asking him to do more. I'm sure I'll heal up good on my own now. Let's put this arm in a sling for a few days, keep the pressure off the mending bone, Leontis said. As the healer applied the sling, Han asked, Do you ever use herbs or plant remedies? Seems like that might help ease some of the... His voice trailed off when Leontis curled his lip in a sneer. If you're speaking of copperhead remedies, they are dangerous and unproven, Leontis said sternly. They have no place in legitimate healing. Well then... Han had some willow bark back in his room he could take for the pain. At least, he used to. No telling where it was now, or if it was still safe to use. Can a wizard heal himself? Han asked. That would come in handy, considering how things were going. It might make it worth paying attention in Leontis's class. Leontis shook his head. No, he said brusquely. Wouldn't be much need for healers, then, would there? Here, take a look in the glass and see what you think. He turned a table mirror so Han could see his face. He had a fat lip, and his right eye was blackened and nearly swollen shut. His cheek was all bruises, but no longer dented. 
It looked like it would heal up all right. Han ran his tongue around the inside of his mouth, found his broken tooth. At least it wasn't right in front, in case he ever smiled again. You'll be stiff and sore in the morning, Leonta said. You also need to rest and build up your magic again. He brushed the back of his hand across Han's undamaged cheek. You're used up. It's not unusual. The patient's magic contributes to healing. The winter sun had already set as Han limped across the quad toward Mistwork Hall and his meeting with Abelard. Students collected in little groups between the buildings, shivering in the raw wind. Ignoring his screaming muscles and joints and his aching head, Han put his shoulders back, lifted his chin, and tried to make a good show, in case somebody was watching. But he felt like an empty vessel, fragile and vulnerable, genuinely scared. If he'd been killed in the fall, it would have been put down to an accident. He'd been careless, and he couldn't afford that. There were countless other accidental ways to die. Bayar and his cousins only had to get lucky once. If he didn't find a way to defend himself, it would be a very long year. Or a very short one. Abelard's offices were luxurious, a suite of rooms on the top floor of Mistwork Hall, overlooking the river. The proficient in the outer office went in to announce Han, then ushered him into the inner office. The dean was seated behind a massive desk, leafing through a stack of papers. On the wall behind her hung a banner emblazoned with an open book, flame gouting from its pages. Thick Weenhaven rugs covered the polished wood floors, muffling sound to a whisper. She allowed Han to stand there a while before she looked up. Her eyes widened when she saw his face. Demon's blood, Alistair, what happened to you? I fell down the stairs, Han said. Didn't Master Blevins tell you? Really? She leaned forward, her sleeves puddling on the surface of the desk. Care to tell me about it? Stairs are tricky at Hampton. Han said, sitting in the available chair without waiting for an invitation. All it takes is one little misstep. Abelard gazed at him a while longer. You're not the one to complain, are you, Alistair? And you know how to keep a secret. That's good. She put her papers away, taking her time, then said, I've looked into your background as I promised, and it seems what you told me is true. As far as it went, you do come from Rag Market. You're a criminal, in fact, a thief and a murderer. The Queen of the Fells has put a price on your head for trying to kill the High Wizard. Han just looked back at her, steady. I can't be the first murderer to attend Mistwork Hall, he thought. Murderers probably get extra credit. She leaned in again, lowering her voice. Did you really try to kill Gavin Bayar? He had it coming, Han said, knowing that the dean had already made up her mind about him anyway. Abelard sat back, resting the heels of her hands on her desk. I can tell you're not stupid, so I'm wondering why you'd take that kind of risk. It was him or me, Han said. Next time I'll aim better. Unexpectedly, the dean laughed. You have no remorse at all. I like that. I'm not the one should be sorry, Han thought. The dean just sat and looked at him for another long moment. Well then, he said, scooting to the front of his seat, you got the goods on me fair. Is that all? That healing has wearied me out, and I'd like to go lie down a while. Abelard raised both hands as if to push him down in his seat. Not so fast, she said. I have something to discuss with you. An opportunity. Opportunity? Han settled back in his chair. What do you mean? The political situation in the Fells is becoming untenable, Abelard said. The truce between the Grey Wolf Line, the Savages, and the Wizard Council is dissolving. 
We wizards are prisoners of restrictions from another time, based on a tragedy that probably never happened. The breaking, you mean? Abelard nodded. The limitations on magic and magical weapons, the restrictions on wizards politically, it makes us weak, too weak to defend ourselves. Many of us believe that the wars in Arden will spread to the rest of the Seven Realms. Here at the Ford, we are particularly vulnerable, having no barrier of mountains to protect us. I've heard that, Han said, wondering why the powerful Dean of Mistwork House was delivering this little speech to the likes of him. The Vale Folk and the Copperheads must be forced to see reason. There will be a need for wizards with your particular skills in the near future, Abelard said. My particular skills? Abelard steepled her hands. Those willing to spill blood if need be. Those who are experienced in that line of work. Han cleared his throat, thinking he must have misunderstood. You're looking for an assassin? I need someone with the flexibility to do whatever is required. Abelard rose and walked to the wall of windows, looking out over Mistwork Quad. You would seem to be uniquely qualified, bright, powerful, and totally without scruples. These are dark times, Han thought, when everybody's in the market for a killer. Abelard turned back toward Han and must have read resistance in his face. Don't worry, you will be well compensated and no one will dare attack you openly while you're under my protection. I intend to return to the fells within the year. If you prove capable, I'll take you with me. She paused, then added delicately, I hope your attachment to that mongrel copperhead won't prove to be a problem. Not for me, Han thought. No way I'm throwing in with you. I've left the life, Han said. As you can see, it's all I can do to manage my classes and readings and studies. I am interested in politics. That's good, Abelard said. That way you'll do as you're told. She paused, and when he didn't respond, went on. Come now. I won't be sending you out with a list of people to kill. We'll start with some special training. I work with a select group of talented students. I would like you to join us. Han sat up straight, resting his hands on his knees. This must be the group Mordra de Villiers had mentioned. What do you mean you work with them? he asked. I provide them with instruction that goes beyond the usual curriculum and introduce them to powerful magical tools. They will be the core of our wizard army and will play a pivotal role in the struggle to come. Who else is in the group? Han asked. Mostly fourth years, proficients, and masters, Abelard said, shifting her eyes away. It's an unusual opportunity for a first year. Are there any other first years? Han persisted. Abelard heaved an exasperated sigh. The Bayar twins, she said. That's a deal breaker, Han said, putting up his hands. Thanks just the same. Abelard shook her head. Hear me out. Politics among wizards is complicated. We have some common goals to defeat the clans and protect ourselves from the fanatics in the south. Thus, we need a well-trained, gifted army. But we aren't of one mind when it comes to other issues, such as who should be High Wizard, who runs the council, and who controls the queen. Like I said, I'm not really interested in politics, Han said. You should know that the High Wizard and I aren't allies. We are rivals, in fact. The Bayars have wielded too much power for too long. I intend to bring them down. Han's head came up, and he stared at her. A turf war within the wizard aristocracy? The dean smiled thinly. Don't look so astonished. You report directly to me. I'm not without influence. 
If our arrangement works out, I can offer you some protection when we return to the Fells. You would like to go back home, wouldn't you? Why would you teach special classes to Micah and Fiona if you're at odds with their father? Han asked. The simple answer is that the High Wizard insisted. They're likely here to keep an eye on me. The Dean's mouth twisted. The more complicated answer is that we need large numbers of well-trained wizards to meet the external threats from the clans and from Arden. So I might do something contrary to my own interests in the short run for the greater good. For the greater good of wizards, you mean, Han said. Of which you are one, I believe, Abelard said dryly. In the long run, I need someone without an agenda of his own, who can dispose of gifted adversaries if need be. Han pushed up from his chair, feeling a little sick. No thanks. Abelard leaned her head back and looked down her nose at him. Did you think you were being given a choice? She said softly. Han was already turning toward the door, but he swung back around to face her. There's always a choice. You can cooperate with me, learn everything you can, and act on my orders. Or be expelled from Mistwork House and sent back to the Fells for hanging. Expelled? Han blurted, his mouth going dry as ashes. For what? Had we known we were harboring a wanted criminal, we wouldn't have admitted you in the first place. Well, it was a choice between two nasty options. Why are you so interested in me? Han asked. Why would you drag someone kicking and screaming into your crew? Because it's unlikely you work for Gavin Bayar, Abelard said, or ever will. He will never forgive you for trying to kill him. Ever. You'd better hope that I win. Just because you're the enemy of my enemy don't mean you're my friend, Han thought. But he kept shut on that. Despite your upbringing, your language, your history, there's also something almost aristocratic about you, the dean said. Maybe it's only arrogance, but I think you could learn to maneuver at court with a little training. I don't need a street thug. I need someone who can move in those circles. She also wants a tool, Han thought. Someone who will never be accepted by her blue blood friends. Someone who has to depend on her handouts for survival. He eyed Abelard, thinking fast. He'd never been one to make long-term plans, and lately his life had been all about buying time. He needed time at Odensford to build his skills in wizardry and protection from his many enemies. The extra classes couldn't hurt either. Abelard could provide that at least, until she found out he'd been playing her. When that happened, he'd still be better off with more weapons. How many times can I pledge my services before my gang lords catch on? All right he said, shrugging. I'm in. Dean Abelard smiled. I knew you were a smart boy, she said. On one condition. Abelard lifted her plucked eyebrows, registering amazement. Which is? Han meant to make his point with the Bayars. He needed to prevent retaliation after. The Bayar twins and their cousins have been dogging me because of what I did to their father, Han said. He touched his swollen cheekbone. They tried to kill me this afternoon, for the second time. I ain't the most patient person. I need you to put a stop to it, unless you want me to hush them right now, which I will do if need be. Abelard raised both hands. No, absolutely not. There's no way I can bring you back to court if their killings are linked to you. Well, you're a cold one, Han thought. I will let them know in no uncertain terms that you are under my protection, she said. They won't cross you again. Good. 
Han rubbed the back of his neck. But wait until they come to you about me, all right? She scowled. What possible reason could there be to... I need to teach them a lesson first, he said. When Abelard opened her mouth to protest, he added, Don't worry, they'll survive. And I won't do aught that can be tied back to me. Lacing her fingers across her torso, the dean gave him a good look over. Just don't get caught. If you do, you're on your own. Han smiled. No worries. He stood. Is there anything else? I meet with my group on Wednesday evenings, here in my office, Abelard said. Be here at seven. Chapter 17 In Mistwork Tower When Han arrived back at Hampton, Dancer met him at the top of the stairs. Bad news. While we were out, somebody made a mess of... What happened to you? He demanded when he got a better look at Han's face. Did she hit you or what? Han blinked at him out of one eye, uncomprehending. Did who hit me? Dean Abelard. That's where you've been, right? Han nodded. I just came from there. She didn't hit me, though. I took a tumble down the stairs. Had to go see Leontus. What? How did you... Han extended the length of rope toward Dancer. Them that scoured up my room left this tied across the staircase. Dancer's face went hard as amber. Master Blevins, does he know about this? He knows I fell down the stairs. They were trying to lift my amulet when he come running. Else I might be dead. Who was it? Micah and his cousins. They left in a hurry when Blevins came. Han swayed, taking hold of the newel post to stay upright. The walk back had nearly done him in. Dancer stuck out a hand to steady him. Come on and sit down before you fall down the stairs a second time. Han followed Dancer down the hallway to his room. The bed was stripped, the linens piled in the corridor, and the broken bits swept up. Thought I'd start on it anyway. Dancer gestured to a chair. Sit. Han felt bad allowing Dancer to do all the work, but he was just too busted to argue. This ain't gonna happen again, he said, just so you know. Hmm. Dancer said skeptically, carrying an armload of Han's slimed clothing out to the hall. Are you thinking Blevins might? Blevins won't do anything. He doesn't run the whole campus anyway. The college town he'd thought was so safe now seemed perilous. It's gotta be me. Us, you mean. When Han said nothing, Dancer said, What are you planning to do? Your protection charms didn't work, and we can't stay here all day and all night. I'm going to meet with Crow and Edeon tomorrow night. See what he's got. I think that fall must have jostled your brain loose, Dancer said, tossing clean sheets over a fresh straw mattress. I don't have a choice. I won't roll over for Bayar. He needs a good basting, and I'm going to give it to him. You're not in rag market anymore, Dancer said. This isn't a gang war. That's what you think. Han worked the fingers of his captive arm. Remember what happened last time you went to Edeon? At least if you fall down the stairs, there's someone around to help. No one can help if I'm dead. Han fingered his swollen eye. If you go after them with magic, Dancer countered, You'll get expelled. It has to be me, and it has to be magic, because that's where he thinks he has the advantage. That's where he does have the advantage. Dancer dipped a brush in soapy water and began scrubbing down the walls. I mean to change that. Han watched Dancer for a few minutes. I'll clean your room for a month, he offered. Soon as I'm out of this sling... Dancer wrinkled his nose. You owe me a year after this, 
he said. And if you insist on going to Edion, then I'm coming with you. Han shook his head. He said to come alone. You need someone to watch your back, Dancer said. He may not even show, Han said. It's been a month. I hope he doesn't, Dancer said. Han stayed in his room all the next day, resting and replenishing his amulet, building it up for his meeting with Crow. After that, and some of Dancer's willow bark, Han felt well enough to walk downtown with Dancer after classes to buy some new clothes to replace those that had been ruined. That took some time. For one thing, Han wasn't used to buying new. There were too many decisions. Fabric, cut, color, style. For another, the tailor took her time. She was a curvy Tamron girly with coal-lined eyes and lips the color of crushed strawberries. At first, she goggled at Han's pounded appearance, but soon she was taking measurements of every possible part of his body and gushing over what a made man he'd be when she was done with him. Her hands lingered on his shoulders and hips and thighs, somewhat longer than necessary. She compared the blue of the velvets to the blue in his eyes. As she draped fabric over his torso, she leaned in and whispered, Come back alone for your fitting. She was pretty enough, and it was an offer he might have welcomed in the past. Now the girlie's pursuit of him just made him feel weary and besieged. You are beaten down, Alistair, he thought. You need a tonic. By then, it was too late to eat in the dining hall, so he and Dancer walked to Bridge Street. They went back to arguing about Edion over dinner. Dancer was as stubborn as any rock, and the debate continued as they walked to the Bayar Library. All right, Han said, exasperated. We're meeting in Edion, in Mistwork Tower. I've never been there, so we'll have to go there for real in order to find it in the dream world. We'll leave about 11.15. That gives us time to get in and get settled. You stand watch while I cross over. If I don't come back, you come after me. Dancer reluctantly agreed. Han beat back the worry that he wouldn't be able to return to Edeon, and that Crow wouldn't be there if he did. Bayar Library was an ornate stone building on the riverbank, linked to Mistwork Hall by arched stone galleries that sheltered students from the weather. The library reminded Han of the family that built it, intentionally intimidating. It resembled a palace of learning, with its elaborately carved stairway railings and thick granite window sills, its massive hearths ablaze late into the night. There were five main floors, meant for first, second, and third-level students, plus two with reading and conference rooms for masters and deans. Even higher were the stacks, reachable only by pull-down staircases and reserved for dedicated scholars. Han ducked self-consciously under the stooping falcon insignia engraved over the door, as if at any moment he might feel those extended talons sink into the skin on the back of his neck and the razor-sharp beak tear into his flesh. In the first-year reading room, the newlings shared access to magical texts so rare that even wealthy heirs of the wizard houses couldn't afford their own. When Han and Dancer walked in, Han saw that Micah Bayar, Will Mathis, and the Mander brothers had already claimed the prime turf next to the fire, their books and papers spread over a large round table. A proficient sat by the door, ready to answer questions, issue passes, and make sure that those who used the reading rooms didn't distract others from their work. Micah was bent over his books as if he were studying hard. He slowly turned the pages, occasionally writing notes in an elegant leather-bound journal. Miphis Mander stared into space, chewing on his pen. When he saw Han, his jaw dropped and his pen fell to the floor. His mouth opened and closed like a beached fish. 
Just then, Fiona walked in from the adjacent room, carrying a large book, her finger marking a place in it. She wore a bored expression that transitioned to puzzlement as she ran her eyes over Han, taking in his bruised face and arm sling. She looked at Micah, then back at Han, and frowned. She wasn't in on it, Han realized. I thought they shared everything, but she didn't know about this plan. I wonder why. Miphis elbowed Micah. Micah lifted his head, looking annoyed, like he was about to bark at his cousin. It was almost, almost worth yesterday's humiliations and injuries to see the astonishment on Micah Bayar's face when he laid eyes on Han. Astonishment that he quickly wiped away. Their eyes met, locked together. Blood and bones, Alistair. What happened to you? Micah said, touching his own cheekbone with his forefinger. Fighting again? Miphis tittered, his eyes shifting from Han to Micah. Fell down the stairs, Han said. Nearly broke my neck, in fact. Perhaps you should watch your step next time, Micah said, stretching lazily. Fiona's puzzlement turned to fury. She cocked back her arm and pegged the book at her brother's head. He just managed to duck in time. It whizzed past him and smacked into the wall with tremendous force. The proficient looked up, glaring, but decided not to intervene when he saw who it was. Will Mathis fetched the book and handed it back to Fiona. She sat down next to Will and opened it, spots of color on her pale cheeks. Fiona had a rum arm. Han made a mental note to remember that. He also wondered what could be going on between the two Bayars. Han and Dancer took a table in a corner. They each chose a book, taking notes on the assigned chapters, then recopying them for the other. Several times, Han looked up to find Fiona watching him fixedly, her pale blue eyes going nearly purple in the flickering candlelight, her hands clenching the book on the table in front of her. Well, have an eyeful, girlie, Han said to himself, massaging his aching head. I can't help how I look. This is your brother's doing. That was the thing. In the Blue Blood world, your enemy dined and danced with you, talking pretty to your face while reaching around to stab you in the back. At ten, Han put his other work aside and pulled out Kinley to reread the chapter about Edeon. He had never planned on going back. Now he had to study up quick. At eleven o'clock, Micah swept up his books and papers and stowed them in his book bag. Pulling on his cloak, he slung the bag over his shoulder and stopped by the proficient's desk for a walking pass since it was past the ten o'clock curfew. It seemed Micah was done for the night. Struggling to concentrate, wondering where Micah had gone, Han read and scribbled until the bells at Mistwork Tower bonged quarter past eleven. Catching Dancer's eyes, Han slid his papers into his carry bag, laying Kinley on top. Dancer collected his books and papers also. Han stood, stretched painfully, and fumbled one-handed into his wool cloak, draping it over his carry bag. He nodded at the proficient, who'd looked up from his book when Han and Dancer stood. Guess we'll head back to the dormitory, Han said. Dancer went to get their passes from the proficient. Miphis Mander leered at Han and whispered, Careful on your way out. That first step is a bone breaker. Pardon me, Han said. Did you say something? He stepped in close to Miphis and leaned down as if to hear better. Miphis snickered, seemingly drawing courage from Han's maimed state. I said, careful out there, that, he hey, 
He sucked in his breath as Han's knife sliced through his breeches from waist to ankle, quick and slick so nobody saw before the blade disappeared. Miphis clutched at his trousers with both hands in an attempt to keep decent. Lucky for you, I'm a rum blade man, lefty or right, Han said under his breath. It was a bit of a brag, but not much. More loudly, he added, you be careful out there. It's a bit brisk to leave your arse hanging out like that. Those at nearby tables turned and stared. Fiona half rose from her seat, then settled back down. Han guessed Miphis wouldn't be reaching for his amulet, since he had both hands busy. Dancer had their passes. Han picked up their lantern and carried it into the hallway. Instead of walking out the door, they climbed the wide staircase to the third floor and ducked into a side room. Han shuddered the lantern while Dancer threaded a rope through the carry handle. Unlatching the window shutters with his good hand, Han threw them open, feeling the chill night air in his face. Sneaking in and out of places was a skill that Han had mastered at a young age. All his life, people had been trying to keep him inside places he didn't want to be, or out of places he needed to get into. Still, it wasn't easy being a one-armed cracksman. He was glad Dancer was along. Boosting himself onto the wide sill, Han poked his legs through and dropped the few feet onto the roof of the galleried walkway. When he landed, a tile broke loose and dropped to the stone walk below, shattering into a thousand pieces and sounding loud as a scream in the dead of night. He froze, but no one came running. You're out of practice, he thought, and his bound arm affected his balance. Dancer followed with the darkened lantern. They light-footed it along the gallery roof, a story above any provost guard or nosy proficient patrolling down below. The roofed walkways made a network of secret pathways that could take him unseen to most anywhere he wanted to go. No one else seemed to be out past curfew, save two cloaked sweethearts who had stowed themselves in the corner where the gallery met Mistwork Hall. They folded into one another, holding hands and whispering. Han felt a pang of regret, thinking of Bird. He wondered if she ever thought of him. No, she'd made it plain enough she never wanted to see him again. The lovers didn't notice Han and Dancer passing over their heads like undead spirits. They had to crab sideways along the wall to where a window opened into Mistwork Hall. Han fished his blade from under his cloak and slid it between the shutters, tipping up the latch inside. He pulled the shutters toward him and peered into an empty classroom. Resting his rump on the stone sill, he turned and slid through, dropping feet first to the floor on the other side. Dancer handed down the lantern, then followed. This is likely not what Leontus meant when he told me to take it easy, Han thought, trying to ignore the nagging ache in his arm and shoulder. Carefully uncovering one pane of the lantern, Dancer peeked out of the door of the classroom. He stood and listened for a moment, head cocked, then motioned Han into the corridor. They followed the corridor until they found a staircase up, Han liked stone staircases. They never creaked. They climbed past the proficient and master floors, circling wide around lighted offices and laboratories. The belfry door was locked, but easily managed with a narrow iron slider that Han had brought along. This door led to an even narrower staircase, wooden this time. It twisted upward, the walls brushing Han's elbows on either side. Rats skittered up the stairs ahead of them, sliding into hidden crevices to either side. At the top of the stairs, an unlocked door led into the bell chamber. 
unshuttering the lantern, Dancer set it in the corner, and they looked around. Bell poles dangled like ghost tails from the four huge bells that provided the cadence of Han's life these days. A ladder leaned against one wall, allowing access to the bell mechanism. Han circled the room, noting every detail so he could return from Edeon. He settled into the corner and retrieved the copy of Kinley from his carry bag. Dancer leaned back against the wall a short distance away. Pulling out a sketchbook, he rested it on his lap. When should I begin to worry? he asked. Give me half an hour, Han said. That's too long, Dancer objected. You don't know how much power you've been able to store up. Try a shorter time at first. I can be dead in five minutes, Han said. I either do this or I don't. I got a lot to learn and not much time. Still, he was nervous, sweating despite the chill wind that leaked through the walls of the belfry. He took deep breaths, trying to settle into a calm place. This time, Griffin wouldn't be available to haul him back if he stayed too long. Hopefully, Dancer could stand in if need be. Watch your back, Bayar had said. I know where you live, and I've got plenty of time. Han's resolve hardened. He settled Kinley onto his lap and thumbed through to the chapter on Edeon. Looking around the room, he stowed away images to anchor him there, then took hold of his amulet and spoke the spell that opened the portal. Again, the rush of darkness. When the light returned, Han was standing on the main floor of the belfry. Moonlight poured through the arched windows, inscribing bright patterns on the wooden floor and illuminating the dust that hung in the air. The dust coalesced, took shape, and organized itself into Crow. As if he'd been waiting eagerly for him. Thank the Maker, Crow said, looking vastly relieved. I was beginning to think something had happened to you. I didn't know whether to keep coming or... I'll hear you out, Han broke in. I'm not making any promises. Crow waved away Han's words. I've no doubt that once you see the potential for... He stopped abruptly, eyes narrowed. What is that you're wearing? Han looked down at himself. He was clad in clan leggings and shirt, bearing no evidence of his recent injuries. Was that how he saw himself? Try this, the blue blood said. Han's clothes reorganized themselves, taking on color and trimmings until he stood dressed in a deep navy blue velvet coat and a snowy linen shirt with lacy cuffs that draped over his hands. Narrow black trousers with a silver buckled belt and black leather boots. The clothes were finer than any Han had ever owned. Crow grinned. Much better. And to finish, he pointed. Han looked at his hands, now weighed down with rings, the stones shifting from rubies to emeralds to diamonds. If they were real, they'd be worth a fortune. Hey, Han said, shaking his hands as if he could fling off the baubles. Get those off or I'm gone. And just like that, the jewelry evaporated, and his clothes shifted to a plain gray coat and black breeches. The clothes still felt different, though, made of finer, softer fabrics, and cut closer to his body. There now, Crow said, sighing and rolling his eyes. You look like a flatland cleric. Is that what you want? What I want is for you to leave my clothes alone, Han said through gritted teeth. I ain't here to play dress up. You should dress like you aspire to be, Crow said. It's all part of the game. Crow extended his arms in front of himself, admiring his lace sleeves and the many rings on his fingers, 
like a rag picker trying on the dress-up clothes Blue Bloods threw away. The only plain thing about him was his amulet, a black crow carved out of onyx with diamonds for eyes. I told you, I ain't a fancy and don't want to be, Hans said, already sorry he'd come. He didn't like that Crow could change their surroundings at will. Putting his back to the wall, he conjured up a blade and made sure that his amulet was exposed and ready for use. He looked up to find Crow stifling laughter at his efforts. Why not a sword instead? Han clutched a massive sword in his fist. Its blade extended nearly to the ceiling, running with blue flames. Crow grinned. Would you like some armor as well? Instantly, Han was weighed down by a heavy gold breastplate, his arms enclosed in chainmail gauntlets. Perhaps that's a bit overdone, Crow said. The sword and armor went as quickly as they came. Han glared at Crow. He'd not come here to be toyed with. Maybe I should step out and close the portal right now, he thought. He took hold of his amulet. It glowed through his fingers like a fallen star. Please forgive me, Crow said, taking a step forward and raising both hands. Here's my point. Your blade's no good here. It's an illusion. I'm not saying that illusions can't be extraordinarily powerful, but the only way to hurt someone in Edeon is through the direct use of magic. That's what you say, Han thought. It all looks rum convincing to me. Are you at least willing to tell me your name now? Crow said. My name's Alistair, Han said. He waited for Crow to reciprocate with an actual name, but he didn't. He seemed distracted, his attention caught by every little sight and sound. The clatter of horse hooves over the cobblestones outside, the flames on the hearth, the pattern on his velvet sleeves. He was like a small child, examining everything as if it were fresh and new and fascinating. A peculiar cove all the way around. This was who he was partnering with? Where do you come from? Han said. You sound like a northerner, but I ain't seen you around campus. Doesn't it stand a reason that I would assume a different guise in Edeon if I didn't wish you to recognize me in the real world? Crow said. There's always the chance that I've misjudged you, that you will betray me if you know who I really am. Which meant he could be anyone. Han closed his hand more tightly around his amulet. Maybe this is what he's really after, Han thought. My amulet. Crow was just stringing him along until he had the chance to take it. Well, Han wouldn't lie down like an easy mark. As if Crow had read Han's thoughts, Crow's amulet changed so it was identical to Han's. There, you see? I'm not lusting after your amulet. I have my own, he said. In the dream world, it was easy to go all mumble-minded about what was real and what wasn't. Look, Han said, you said you could teach me magic. I can, Crow said. What I can teach you will make you the most powerful charm caster in the Seven Realms. He walked to the arch window and gazed out, then turned and rested the heels of his hands on the sill. But there's a price, he said. Ha, Han thought. Here's where the breaker demands my soul in payment. Well, he'd dealt with connivers before. He knew when to walk away from a bad deal. What's your price? Han asked, feigning indifference. I will not invest my time in someone who will never make full use of the gift of knowledge I offer, Crow said. If we are to be allies, I shall expect improvement in every aspect of your life, your speech, your manners, your attire. He flicked his hand toward Han, 
taking in his clothing. Hans stared at him, taken by surprise. You want me to turn into a bleeding blue blood? That's your price? Crow studied his hands, twisting the elaborate ring on his right forefinger. Our time in Edeon is limited as is. I don't want to spend it showing you how to navigate in society. Surely you can find someone else to teach you those skills. Look, Han said, I don't got time to learn the things I need to learn, let alone studying pretty speech and manners. Crow stepped close to Han, leaning in so they were nearly nose to nose. Don't underestimate the Bayars. You've been lucky so far, but it's only because they've underestimated you. They will destroy you if you don't learn to meet them at their level. It's more than spellcasting. It's more than a powerful amulet. It's politics and the law and winning powerful people to your side. That requires you to be articulate, at least. What do you care if they destroy me? Han said. It's no skin off you if I lose. Let's just say it's a grudge match, Crow said, turning to look out of the tower windows. I hate Airy House, he said softly. They destroyed everything I care about. We have something in common then, Han thought, if he's telling the truth. Still, the blue blood was right now he thought on it. Han had to learn to fight on their turf. If he didn't, he would go down quick. He recalled the humiliating experience of the Dean's dinner. It might be worth his time to avoid a repeat performance. All right, Han said. I'll look for a teacher. But if you're going to help me, it can't wait until I learn to talk pretty. The Bayars have come after me twice now. Third time's the charm. Crow stiffened, his blue eyes brilliant against his pallor. They've come after you. What do you mean? They've been trying to kill me and take the amulet. I need to put a stop to it. Crow shook his head, a quick, dismissive movement. No, I will not allow this, he said, pounding his fist into his other hand. I've finally found someone I believe I can work with, and I won't let them... He trailed off, as if belatedly recalling that Han was there. We will stop them, he said, his face hard and resolute. I'll show you a charm that will destroy them and never leave a trace to connect it with you. No, Han said, surprised that Crow would take his possible murder so hard. That ain't what I want. I do that, I'll be climbing the deadly Nevergreen in no time. You what? Crow stared at him. They'll send me back home for hanging, Han said. Anyway, killing ain't all that impressive. Any fool can kill you if they want to make a name and don't care what it costs. That's why even smart street lords go down sooner or later. Han slid back his sleeves finding that he liked the feel of the soft wool. Killing is one way to handle a rival, but it also shows respect. It shows he's important enough to have a chat with. A better way is to humble him. Make him look a fool. Show him that the price for coming after you is his reputation. Crow blinked at Han, looking as astonished as if one of the bricks in the wall had gotten up and given a pretty speech. I could hush that lot if I wanted to. I don't need your help for that, Han went on. That's one thing I'm good at. But I don't want to. I just need to make them sorry they came after me so they don't try it again. So I can get on with my business. Crow furrowed his brow as if surprised that Han had plans of his own. Your business? Which is? My business. Han repeated. He could keep secrets as well as Crow. I want to use magic to scare off the Bayars. 
I want something nobody's seen before, so I won't be suspected nor expelled. Hmm, Crow said, rubbing his chin and regarding Han with grudging respect. Don't think too long, all right? I gotta do something before they come after me again. Meantime, I need to keep them out of my room. I want something that won't kill anybody, but will keep them out, he repeated for emphasis. Got anything like that? Of course, Crow said, rolling his eyes. To clarify, do you want to exclude specific people or everyone but you? Specific people. I also need to know how to get through any protective charms they've laid down. Crow extended his hand, and lines of flaming spellwork appeared on the stone wall of the tower. That's the incantation, he said. You need to speak it at each entrance to your room, doors and windows. Anchor it to your enemies with this line, using their hair, blood, or flesh. More spellwork appeared. Not only will this keep them out, but it will mark them so you can tell if they've tried to cross your threshold. Mark them? How? Han asked suspiciously. Crow smiled crookedly. Boils and pustules, he said. Lots. Now, here's how to disable charms of protection they may have laid. It's very versatile, and you don't need to know what charms they used. He reviewed more spell work. Han studied it over until he was sure he had it down, but the hard knot of suspicion in his stomach wouldn't go away. I'm taking a big chance here, he said. If I snabble their rooms and your charm doesn't work, I'll be in a world of trouble. He waved his hand. Show me something. I want to see you do magic in the real world. Crow thought for a moment, then said, Fair enough, but we'll have to leave Edeon in order to do that. He walked straight toward Han. Han backed away, but he came up against the wall. The other wizard kept coming until he seemed to slide into Han, chilling his bones like an icy wind out of the spirits. Now speak the charm to close the portal, Crow said inside his head. Han took hold of his amulet and spoke the charm. Again, the passageway through the darkness. Dancer looked up, startled, as Han opened his eyes. The slant of the light told Han he was back in Mistwork Tower, the real one. He wore his regular clothes, the sling supporting his right arm. His collarbone throbbed, suddenly painful. Dancer scrambled to his feet. Hunts alone. What happened? Why did you come back so soon? This requires very little power, which is all you have, Crow whispered in Han's ear. Use the same anchor charm with this one, too. Han's fingers described a charm, and conjure words spilled out of his mouth as Crow spoke through him. For a moment, it seemed that nothing had happened. Then... Han heard a rush of sound, thousands of tiny movements all around him. The walls of the belfry seemed to come alive with bright eyes and whiskered faces and rodents' teeth. Rats and mice poured from every crevice and crack, swarming out onto the floor and rolling toward him like a furry gray sea capped with flickering worm-like tails. Han heard a flapping sound overhead, and clouds of bats dropped from the highest reaches of the belfry, soaring down toward him, opening triangular mouths, exposing needle-sharp teeth. Ah! Reflexively, Han threw up his left arm to protect his head and face. Leathery skin brushed over him. Bats smacked into him and dropped to the floor, straightening their wings, looking bewildered. Dancer seized hold of the lantern and swung it in a wide arc, forcing the rodents back. Han joined him in his corner, and they put their backs to the walls. Rats and mice slipped past Dancer's lantern, swarming over Han's feet, sinking their razor-sharp teeth into his ankles. 
The magic was real. The magic had crossed over, and it was anchored to him. Han danced from one foot to the other, trying to shake off the rodents climbing his breeches. He extended his hand, meaning to channel power into the teeming hordes. Then he remembered he was in the wood and stone bell tower of Mistwork Hall and risked setting it aflame in the process. Taking hold of the amulet again, Han spoke the thorn-hedge charm, spinning in a circle. A thicket of thorns arose all around them, so tight and impenetrable that the rats impaled themselves on the thorns. Dancer stomped the few rats that had slipped through, while Hans swatted at the bats that still spiraled down from above. Good job, Crow said in Hans' ear, his voice low and amused. Very creative. Now make them go away. He followed up with the charm, spoken through Han's lips. The heaving sea of rodents drained away into the walls as though someone had pulled a stopper plug. Moments later, Han and Dancer were alone in the bell tower, surrounded on three sides by a thorn hedge, ringed by rat corpses. Han's heart pounded, his shirt soaked with sweat. He slid down the wall until his backside hit the stone floor. Crow whispered in his ear again, Tomorrow night, midnight, same place. And please, build up a little more power in your amulet next time. We have lots to do, and we need to work fast. And then he was gone. Hunts alone? Dancer knelt next to him. What in the name of Hanalea's blood and bones was that all about? Hans scraped his damp hair off his forehead and sat thinking until his breathing steadied and his heart slowed. He looked up at Dancer and smiled. I think I know how to solve our burglar problem, he said. Chapter 18 Abelard's Crew Abelard's crew of exceptional students met in the dean's office, familiar to Han from his previous visit. Chairs ringed a polished wood table in a plush meeting room with a view of the river. Refreshments were set out under the window. Han made it a point to arrive early. Master Griffin came early also so he could get into the room and settled before everyone else arrived. Han was surprised to see Griffin, since he and Abelard didn't seem to get on. Maybe his family had clout, too. Timis Hadron, the proficient who'd greeted Han the day he arrived, circled the table, arranging writing materials and books in front of each seat. Mordra arrived soon after. Han was relieved when she took a seat next to Master Griffin instead of him. He didn't care to be lectured in manners again in front of a crowd. The Bayars walked in with Abelard. The dean must have briefed them on their new classmate. Micah pretended to ignore Han as he found a seat on the opposite side of the table by the door. Fiona's eyes brushed over Han like icy fingers, making his skin pebble up. He wondered what Abelard had said to them. Don't worry, he's my hired bravo. Fiona and Mordra exchanged daggery glances, then ignored each other. Good evening, Abelard said, taking the empty seat at the head of the table. I've invited Hans and Alistair to join our gatherings. Although Alistair is a newling, I think you will find that he brings a special range of skills to share with us. Resting a proprietary hand on Han's shoulder, Abelard pointed out each of the members in turn. Timis Hadron is a proficient, though he'll soon take his master's examinations. You know, Master Griffin, you met proficient de Villiers at dinner, and, of course, you already know Micah and Fiona Bayar. Abelard walked to her seat at the head of the table. Alistair, 
Each week, one of our members presents on a topic in advanced charm casting and leads the others through a practical demonstration, if possible. Of course, some types of magic are impossible to trial safely. Others we can't master because we no longer have the tools that were used when the techniques were developed. Han nodded. Some of these techniques are, in fact, forbidden by the naming. For that reason, it is imperative that nothing of what we do here is discussed outside our small circle. Do you understand? Han nodded again, knowing that his life would hang by a thread once Abelard found out that he was working for the clans. We will expect you to contribute to our series eventually, Abelard said. Alistair has special expertise in the area of travel to Edeon, she said to the others. He has agreed to share it with the rest of us. I don't really remember agreeing to that, Han thought, but he kept shut. Now, let's continue our discussion from last week, Abelard said. She nodded to Timus Hadron. Proficient Hadron, if you would, please. Hadron spread out some notes on the table. As most of you know, I've been researching evidence for the existence of the Armory of the Gifted Kings, he said. Excuse me, Han said, wondering whether he should raise his hand. Armory of the Gifted Kings? Fiona straightened, twisting a lock of her hair between her thumb and forefinger. Micah glared up at the ceiling. The gifted kings of the Fells accumulated a vast collection of magical pieces and weapons, Hadron said. It disappeared around the time of the breaking. The weapons may have been destroyed by the spirit clans to keep them out of wizard hands. Some say the demon king hid them away, meaning to retrieve them later. A third theory is that they were confiscated by one of the wizard houses that laid siege to the Demon King's stronghold on Grey Lady. Did Han imagine it, or did Hadron glance at Micah and Fiona when he said that? We've been searching for the armory since the naming and the restoration of the Grey Wolf line, Abelard said. Hmm, Han thought. If anyone held the keys to the magical storeroom, it'd be the Bayars. They'd owned at least one forbidden amulet, the one Han now wore. Hadron went on to review the sketchy evidence he had collected. So I think we can say with confidence that the armory existed at one time, he concluded. The question is, does it still exist, and if so, where is it? Here we need to dig deeper. As Hadron continued, Han looked up from his note-taking to see Fiona, head down, hand flying across the page. Micah, too, seemed transfixed, his black eyes focused on Hadron, his face pale and intent. Were they worried that Hadron might uncover its location? Did they plan to report back to Papa? Or was it possible that they didn't know where it was either? Maybe they were as eager as anyone to find it. Maybe Han could beat them to it. He scribbled faster, splattering ink across the page. Most of the focus to date has been on libraries and temple records in Felsmart, Hadron said. But evidence suggests that many records that predated the breaking were carried here to Odin's Ford for safekeeping. So there could be materials archived in the Bayar Library that would help us locate the armory. That would be like finding a flea on a dog, Griffin said. Have you seen what's up there? What would you suggest we do then? Abelard asked Hadron, ignoring Griffin. Mordor and I will be here over the summer, Hadron said. We could begin a methodical search of the stacks in Bayar Library. Mordra wrinkled her nose at that suggestion, but Hadron didn't see. Any of you who are staying on are welcome to help, he said. No one volunteered. He cleared his throat. 
Think about it and let me know. Thank you, Hadron, Abelard said. Given the constant litany of complaints about the lack of powerful weapons at our disposal, it is my expectation that those of you who stay on for the summer will join Proficients Hadron and de Villiers in their research. She swept her gaze over her crew. When no one objected, she continued. Now de Villiers will report on the topic of magical possession. The dean nodded at Mordra. Mordra tapped her finger on the stack of pages in front of her. Possession is a magical technique that first achieved prominence during the War of the Conquest, when the mainland was invaded by wizards from the Northern Islands. It also proved useful during the reign of the Gifted Kings, both for keeping the peace and in counter-espionage activities. Mordra looked around the table as if to make sure she was the focus of everyone's undivided attention. Han's eyes fixed on the tattoos on her arms. They wriggled and swam against her skin. He looked away. Eventually, the spirit clans developed talismans to defend against possession, which limited its effectiveness. Still, it was commonly used up until the time of the breaking when the tactic was forbidden by the naming. The Demon King was said to have used it to eliminate pairs of rivals. He would possess one, then induce him to murder the other. Thereafter, the first would be executed for the crime. Hmm, Han thought. Great-grandfather Alger was rum clever. I wonder how great-grandmother Hanalea got the best of him. You see before you three common variations on the spell work used to activate the possession charm, Mordra went on. These represent degrees of possession. In some cases, the possessor merely precipitates actions the possessee wouldn't undertake on his own. In others, possession is complete and the possessing wizard has total control of the, uh, subject. Once possession has taken place, it's easier to subsequently accomplish. The possessor must be in close proximity to the subject. It's most successfully used on an unwitting target, who can therefore raise little defense. We are reasonably confident of the authenticity of the spell lines we've unearthed from the archives. Mordra went on to demonstrate the spoken charms and gestures used in casting the spell. You should know that no one has used these incantations successfully since the breaking. Modern amulets don't seem to support this kind of magic. Her shoulders slumped, and when Han scanned those around the table, they wore matching glum expressions. No offense meant, Griffin said, but does it make sense to spend so much time on spell work we're unlikely to be able to use? Why don't we try it, Han said. What have we got to lose? Heads turned all around the table. Master Griffin is right, Han said. It's like passing out warm sugar cakes and telling us not to take a bite. What do you suggest, Alistair? Abelard said dryly. Let's pair off, Han said. See if anybody can make it work. He paused, then added, I'll go with Micah. Lacing his fingers across his chest, he cradled the serpent amulet and slid a smile across the table to Bayar. For a long moment, no one said anything. Abelard looked from Han to Micah, as if trying to divine Han's intentions. All right the dean said, shrugging. Why not? I choose Hadron, Mordra said. Han wasn't sure if she was aiming to stay away from Fiona or cozy up to an almost master. No, Micah said, pressing both hands flat against the tabletop. I will not team up with Alistair. He can work with someone else. Abelard's lips tightened. Nuling Bayar, we discussed this, and maybe you have your reasons for inviting a street thug to our gatherings, 
Micah said, his face bone white and furious. But you should remember that this gutter whelped thief attacked my father and nearly killed him. Eyes widened all around the table. Some shifted away from Han. What's the matter, Micah? Han said, tilting his head back and looking down his nose at the high wizard's son. Are you afraid? He fingered the demon king's amulet. Micah stood. I merely believe that if one associates with filth, eventually the stench rubs off. He inclined his head to Abelard. Dean Abelard, if you will excuse me. Turning on his heel, he walked out. Fiona stared after her brother, then looked back at Han, eyes narrowed in appraisal. She looked almost impressed. The others also sat frozen, sliding wary looks at Han. He guessed that no one else would be eager to pair up with him either. Abelard looked up at the clock on the wall. Our time is up, she said, as if she were glad of it. Too bad. Next week, Master Griffin will lead a discussion of glamours and their use in warfare. Chairs scraped back as Abelard's crew beat a hasty retreat. Chapter 19 Caught in the Act The spidery diagram swam on the page, and Race's eyes practically crossed as she forced herself to focus. Earthwork fortifications used against pirates along the Indio after the breaking. She faced yet another test in history of warfare. At least the term is almost over, she thought. Pushing her book aside, she glanced around. It was almost dinner time, but the common room was empty, save for her. This was Eamon's only night free of obligations. Raysa meant to intercept him and have an actual conversation. He'd been less available than ever these past few weeks, almost furtive. Speaking of furtive, lifting the blotter, Raysa pulled a few scribbled pages from underneath and reviewed what was left there. Mother, please know that I am well and safe, and I hope this finds you well also. I know you were under considerable pressure in the days leading up to my name day, and that you truly believed that a marriage to Micah Bayar was the best way to keep me safe. After reading it over, Raysa scratched through A Marriage to Micah Bayar and substituted The Marriage You Had Planned for Me. That way, if the letter fell into the wrong hands, it might have been from any daughter or son who fled an unwanted marriage. I beg you to consider that what seems safest may turn out to be most dangerous. It may be that the danger you saw coming was the marriage itself, a danger to me and a danger to you as well. I long to come home and present my case in person if we can find a way to do that safely. I will get this letter into my father's hands somehow and hope that he will get it to you. If that should happen... Please keep it among us three. There has been one attempt on his life already. If we begin a dialogue, perhaps we can work out a way for me to come home, which is what I want most in the world. Though it may be selfish, I can't help but hope that you are missing me as I am missing you. Please know that I love you, and while love may not be sufficient to heal the breach between us, it's a place to start. Hallie and Talia came stomping down the stairs, and Raysa pushed the letter into her carry bag. You coming to dinner? Hallie asked. I hear it's ham and cabbage. I'll wait for Corporal Byrne, Raysa said, and walk over with him. Hallie and Talia looked at each other. I'm not sure he's coming to dinner, Hallie said, rubbing the side of her nose with her forefinger. I think he has plans. Plans? Come with us, Talia urged. We'll go out somewhere after. Don't be a hermit. 
Some undercurrent in their speech set Race's teeth on edge. I'll be over in a few minutes, she said lightly. Save me some ham. They walked out the door with many backward looks, their faces set and anxious. A few minutes later, Eamon descended the stairs. He wore his dress blues, with creases in his trousers, and his hair neatly combed off his forehead. He nearly stumbled when he saw Rasa, but kept his feet and continued to the bottom. Hello, Eamon, Rasa said. You're looking handsome. He looked down at himself, then tugged at the hem of his uniform jacket to straighten it. Right. Well, thank you. Rasa pushed up out of her chair and went and stood in front of him. I hoped we could go to dinner together, maybe have a chance to talk. I never see you anymore. He stood frozen, like a schoolboy caught out in a prank, his gray eyes fixed on her face. We're both busy, Ray. It stands to reason that we wouldn't... Let's go to dinner, then, Rasa said, taking his hands in hers. He swallowed hard, the long column of his throat jumping. I can't. I have something I need to do. Race's instincts screamed that persistence would lead to heartbreak, but she couldn't help herself. I'll come with you then, and after maybe we... No, he said. Not tonight. I... we can't. He looked as miserable as she'd ever seen him. But it's your only night off. Rasa knew she sounded desperate and didn't care. He nodded. I know. I'm sorry, he whispered, his face pale and strained. Rasa cast about for something, anything that might change his mind, that might make him stay. Well she said, swallowing down the dull ache of longing. Then take this with you and think of me. She kissed her first two fingers, then, standing on tiptoes, reached up and pressed them against his lips. Seizing her wrist, he pressed her hand against his cheek, smooth from recent shaving. He closed his eyes, took two shuddering breaths, and let her go. Goodbye, Rasa, he said, his voice thick and unfamiliar. Go on to dinner. I'll be back late. And he was gone. Rasa stood frozen for a heartbeat, then grabbed her cloak and slipped out the door, following after him. Fortunately, the streets were crowded packed with cadets heading back to the dining halls for dinner or walking toward Bridge Street and the eateries there. Eamon walked fast, so Rasa had to trot to keep up. Once he swung around and looked back, but she managed to duck into a doorway. Rasa soon realized that he was heading for Bridge Street, and when he started across, she hesitated briefly to tug her hood over her head, before stepping onto the bridge. It was the first time she'd crossed it since the day she'd arrived. Eamon made one stop at the flower cellars on the bridge, where he bought a small bouquet of mixed flowers. Rasa forced down despair. A voice in her head whispered, Go back. But she didn't. Eamon hurried on as if he knew the way, turning onto the quad that separated Mistwork Hall and the Temple School. The winter-seared lawn bloomed with a mixture of red Mistwork robes and white temple garments. Rasa pulled her head back into her cowl like a turtle into its shell. What if he goes into Mistwork, Rasa thought. Crossing the bridge is risky enough. I can't follow him in there. But Eamon stepped onto the stone walk that led to the temple school, turning off to the entrance at the far right. In front of the heavy wooden door, he paused long enough to take a swipe at his hair, then raised the knocker and let it fall with a clatter.
Raisa had remained on the main walk, off at an angle, so she couldn't see who came to the door. But Eamon bowed at the waist and extended the flowers. Then he stepped inside, closing the door behind him. For a long moment, Raisa stood frozen on the walk, unsure what to do next. The broad porch was crowded with dedicates and students, so she couldn't very well go up and listen at the door. But perhaps if she circled around... Fortunately, the ground floor was lined with tall windows and glass doors, spilling light into every room. Raisa crept along the perimeter of the building, between the shrubbery and the foundation, peering into every window. Though some were probably at dinner, Raisa saw dedicates and students reading, relaxing, doing stitchery, painting, playing instruments, and the like. This is what everyone had intended for me, Raisa thought, fingering her dun-colored uniform tunic. In the rear was a parlor, a cheerful fire in the fireplace, and trays of cookies and sandwiches set out on tables. Eamon was there, sitting in a chair by the fireplace, his back very straight, his hands on his knees. Across from him sat a girl in temple dress, dark-skinned and pretty, with masses of long, curly hair. A southern islander. She clutched the nosegay in one hand, and every so often she raised it to her nose and took a sniff. Two other couples shared the room, and a rosy-faced dedicate sat in a far corner, keeping an eye on the young lovers. Eamon's face was in profile, but Raisa could see the girl's shy smile and her large, dark eyes, and hear the murmur of their conversation. Any fool could see that the girl was in love with Eamon Byrne. Raisa's eyes burned with hot tears. Was this possible? Honest, straightforward Eamon Byrne was cheating on her? She tried to ignore the voice in her head that said it wasn't cheating if there hadn't been a relationship to begin with. But you don't lie to your friends, Raisa said to herself defensively. He'd gone out of his way to hide this from her. And then, as if in a bad dream that turns into a nightmare, she saw Eamon stiffen, squaring his shoulders under the blue wool. He slowly turned his head so that he was looking right at Raisa. For a long moment, she was petrified, unable to move, and they stared at each other. Then, cheeks flaming, she dropped below the windowsill and scrambled backward like a crab out of the shrubbery. She stood upright and fled toward the front of the building. She'd gone only a few yards when a hand closed tightly around her upper arm, jerking her sideways. Raisa twisted around to face another Southern Islander in temple dress, this one as unlikely a candidate as she'd ever seen. The multiple piercings in her nose and ears were pegged with silver. She clutched a wicked-looking knife in her free hand. Even worse, she looked oddly familiar. Who you spying on, dirtback? The girl gave Raisa a little shake. N Nobody, Raisa said, trying to pull free. Let go, that hurts. I want to know who you are and what you... The blade-wielding temple student's eyes narrowed in recognition. I know you, she said. I've seen you someplace. That's not surprising. I go to school here, too, Raisa said, grabbing at dignity with both hands. I just wanted to see what it's like in the temple. You're from the Fells, the dedicate said, avidly studying Raisa's face. Then her eyes widened in astonishment. You was the girly with Cuffs Alistair. You the one walked into Southbridge Guardhouse after the raggers. It was Cat. Cat Tyburn, the street lord who had replaced Cuffs as leader of the raggers, Alistair's former girlfriend. It was no wonder Raisa hadn't recognized her at first. Cat looked different, 
almost cared for, like a weedy, thorny garden that some gifted gardener had taken on. Her eyes were brilliantly clear, not cloudy like before, and she'd put on weight. What was she doing at Odin's Ford? I don't know what you're talking about, Rasa said. Her mind flashed to her sighting of Cuff's Alistair by the stables. Could there be a connection? It didn't matter. She had to get away. In desperation, she rammed her fist into Cat's middle, hoping she wouldn't get her own throat cut in the process. Fortunately, Cat was distracted and hadn't seen the blow coming. She crumpled, dropping the knife. Rasa took off running again, this time clearing the temple clothes and the quad and turning onto Bridge Street. She ran like she was being pursued by demons. Chapter 20 Star-Crossed Rasa ran all the way to Grendel Hall. She charged through the common room, drawing puzzled stares from Mick and Garrett, who were playing cards, and Talia and Hallie, who hadn't gone out after all. She loped up the stairs, into a room, slammed the door, and flopped face down on her bed. A few minutes later, she heard the door open softly. Rebecca? It was Talia. Go away, Rasa said into her pillow, wishing she had a room to herself. Wishing she were a princess again so she could order people around. Of course, Talia didn't go away, but came and sat on the side of the bed. I thought you were going out, Rasa muttered. We decided not to, Talia said, stroking Rasa's hair. Did you follow him? Rasa nodded, her face still pressed into the pillow. How long have you known he was seeing someone? A while. He hasn't kept it a secret. From anyone but me, Rasa finished. She wished she could disappear. Was it that obvious she was in love with Eamon? How could she ever face any of them again? Talia pressed her hands into Race's shoulders, digging deep into the muscles, working free the knots. He didn't want to hurt you. I see. So he discussed it with the triple, and you all agreed that... No, no, no. Talia's hands stilled themselves. It wasn't like that at all. He's not a very good liar, and he's so bloody honorable. He's been absolutely miserable, if you haven't noticed. Rasa could hear the love in Talia's voice. Every member of the Grey Wolves loved Eamon Byrne. They had that in common. The door opened and closed again, and Rasa twitched irritably. There now, Talia said. Hallie's brought you some tea, is all. I'll get you something stronger if you'd like, Hallie said. I got some brandy will put you out like a doused candle. Rasa shook her head. She needed a clear mind. We didn't know what had been between you, Talia went on, or if any promises had been made, but... None, Rasa said bitterly. There was nothing... We were friends, that's all. I used to think I was good at reading people, she thought. I loved Eamon, and I was convinced he loved me back, or that I could make him love me if I could just break through the barriers of class and duty. Could they ever be friends again? She didn't even have the energy to be worried about running into Cat Tyburn. Just then... Getting her throat cut seemed like an easy out. For the next hour, Hallie and Talia soothed her, plied her with tea, and tried to feed her dinner. Much of the time, they just sat with her, holding her hands, saying nothing. Amid the heartbreak and self-blame, Rasa felt propped up by their presence. Maybe this was what it was like to have real friends. Finally, she heard the creaking of the stairs and recognized Eamon's step. We'll stay if you want, Hallie said quickly, no matter what the corporal says. Rasa shook her head. 
We need to talk. We've needed to talk for a long time. He knocked on the door. Come in, Talia said, and Eamon pushed open the door. He stood looking at the three of them, his expression haggard and grim. Talia and Hallie kissed Rasa on opposite cheeks. We'll be downstairs if you need us, Talia said, and they left, circling Eamon, giving him the hard eye. Silence coalesced around them. Rasa sat up in bed, her back against the wall, her arms wrapped around her knees. Finally, Eamon fetched the chair from Rasa's desk and set it next to the bed. He sat down in it. I'm glad you got back safely, he said. I should have come after you straight away as soon as I saw you'd crossed the bridge. Well, that would have been awkward, Rasa said, resting her chin on her knees. This isn't going to be about me crossing the bridge, is it? He shook his head. No, it's not going to be about that. He toyed with a heavy gold ring on his left hand, the ring with the circling wolves. Rasa almost wished it would be. She'd rather fight with him than have this conversation. Who is she? Eamon looked up. Her name is Anna Maya Dubai he said. Her family is from the Southern Islands, as you could probably tell. Her father is military. He's a mercenary in the Fells. He's one of the few stripers in the regular army that my father trusts. How did you meet her? Rasa asked. My father and her father set it up. They thought we would be well matched. It sounded like they were a pair of carriage horses. Well, Rasa said, nodding, she is tall. Stop it, Ray, Eamon said. I'm not apologizing for seeing her. I'm apologizing for keeping it a secret from you. You can beat on me all you want, but leave her out of it. She's sweet and hardworking and well-read. She's an excellent harpist, very talented, and she's great with horses. She's lived in a military family all her life, so she'll understand what that's like that my first duty is to the guard. Then it hit Rasa like a fist in the face. Her heart began to pound so hard that it seemed Eamon must be able to hear it. You intend to marry her, she whispered. He nodded, his gaze fixed on the floor. Not till after I graduate from the academy, but the plan is we'll announce our betrothal when we return to the fells in the summer. What? Race's voice rose. You're getting married and you never told me? He looked up at her, his gray eyes swimming with guilt. I have no defense. It was wrong, and I know it. I just didn't have the courage to tell you. The conversation was like a series of body blows. She wanted to hurt him back. Well, Clearly she's everything one could want in a wife, a horsey harpist, Rasa wanted to say. But when she looked up at Eamon, his expression was so bleak and hopeless that the words dried up on her tongue. You don't love her, she whispered. I didn't say that. But you don't. I can tell. Don't try to lie to me. You're no good at it. He gazed at her, and Rasa could tell he was debating giving it a try anyway. Then he shrugged his shoulders. I'll be a good husband to her, he said. And he would, except for the minor detail that he didn't love her. Well, Rasa thought, if he's going to marry anyone he doesn't love, it's going to be me. Before you go through with this, there's something you should know, Rasa said crisply. It's important that you make an informed decision. From Eamon's expression, he might have been facing a firing squad. Ray, please, before you say anything, there's something I should have told you before now. I wanted to tell you, only... Da said I shouldn't, because we... No, hear me out, Rasa said. And then you'll get your turn. She took a deep breath. Eamon, you're my best friend. You always have been. You're the most honorable person I know. 
and apparently you're not the kind of person to get involved with a girl when you know it can't go anywhere. He kept his gray-eyed gaze locked on her face. No, he said quietly. I'm not that kind of person. She took his hands, rubbing her thumbs across his palms. She needed that physical connection to maintain her courage. Me, I accepted that we could never marry, but I was willing to take you on whatever terms you would offer. She smiled. That's what we do, the Grey Wolf Queens. We take what we can get when it comes to love. That's why they call us witches and harlots in the South. Eamon closed his eyes, his lashes dark against his sun-roughened skin. His hands tightened on hers. Your Highness, please don't say things you'll regret later. I don't want things to be awkward between us. No, Raisa said. I think I'd regret not saying them, and things are already as awkward as they can be. She paused, and when he said nothing, went on. So, I know that I should make a political marriage, one that benefits the Fells and the line, but it's a new day. The Fells has never sent a princess heir to Odin's Ford. Here I'm learning to let go of old ideas and embrace new ones. There has to be a way to make it work. Make what work? He whispered like a dying man who exposes his throat, waiting for the killing stroke. I love you, she said simply. I'm asking you to marry me. Raisa couldn't have said what kind of response she expected, but not an expression of mingled desire, grief, and despair. You don't understand, Eamon whispered, shaking his head. I can't. We can't. I know we're young, she said quickly. I didn't want to marry so soon either. But if we marry, that takes a marriage to Micah Bayar off the table. We can go back to the Fells together, and that will stifle talk of putting Melanie on the throne. I think the people would welcome a marriage to a native-born rather than a foreigner. The clans especially would welcome a Byrne. They respected Eamon's father, Eden Byrne, and the Byrnes weren't magical or beholden to a foreign power. It made so much sense, she had to make him see it. It was what she wanted, and practical, too. But Eamon just stared down at his boots. I know there are obstacles, Raisa said quickly. My mother won't approve. Maybe your father feels the same way. But we can win them over. You could learn to love me, she thought. I'll teach you. It's not that simple. Eamon said, gently withdrawing his hands from her grasp. I'm not free to marry you. Raisa's heart stuttered. What do you mean you're not free? A terrible thought crowded into her mind. Do you mean because you're already betrothed? She fixed on the gold ring on his left hand, similar to her own. No, he said. I'm not betrothed. He twisted the ring, sliding it up and down on his finger. Is it my turn? Can I speak now? She nodded, even though she had a terrible feeling she wouldn't like what he had to say. You know that the office of Captain of the Queen's Guard is a legacy title in my family, he said, by Hanalia's decree a thousand years ago. Raisa nodded. Legacy titles weren't unusual, though more common among the nobility than the military. It typically goes to the firstborn of each generation. The successor is selected by the previous captain to serve the new queen when she ascends to the throne. He paused, as if waiting for a response from Raisa, but she said nothing. I've been chosen to serve as your captain, he said. Da and I discussed it before.